Good afternoon. We will uh, reconvene our meeting. We will start with agenda item 18, an update on public health response. I'll turn it over to staff for their presentation. You starting out. You're starting. You're starting. Good afternoon, Chair Fletcher, members of the board. On August 2nd of 2022, our public health officer, Dr. Will Wooten, issued a declaration of local health emergency pursuant to Cal California Health and Safety Code Section 101080 as a result of the global outbreak of monkeypox and the local impacts of public health. I am joined by Dr. Will Wooten, who will provide an overview of the current monkeypox outbreak, as well as our public health services director, Dr. Liz Hernandez will share details of the local public health response related to monkeypox education and outreach efforts. Now please welcome Dr. Wood. Good afternoon, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. For this presentation, we will refer to monkeypox as MPOX. As you are aware, in May of this year, clusters of MPOX cases were identified in multiple countries, particularly in Europe. Over the ensuing months, cases have spread globally. This map shows geographic areas where the viral infection has historically been observed, depicted by the blue dots. The infection is endemic in the western and central regions of Africa, occurring in household members, uh, including children. This is compared to the current worldwide 2022 MPOX outbreak, characterized by the orange dots. Globally, as of August 29, there have been 48,844 cases reported in over 99 countries. This current, uh, the current case count for the United States and California is shown in this slide. There are currently 18,101 confirmed cases in the United States where every state now has reported at least one to 10 cases. The state of California has reported 3,369 confirmed and probable cases as of Friday, August 26th. This next slide shows the current case count for San Diego County. As of Sunday, August 28th, there were 275 confirmed and probable cases reported in the region. Cases are reported daily, Monday through Friday. Now the current case count and demographic breakdowns for San Diego County are shown here and updated weekly. These data are reported by CDC Disease Week, which is Sunday through Saturday. Beginning next week, these updates will be published on Tuesdays instead of Mondays. In San Diego County, as of Saturday, August 27th, there were 270 confirmed and probable cases. Of the confirmed and probable cases, of these confirmed, and probable cases, 266 individuals are male. Regarding sexual orientation, 183 cases self-identified as gay, lesbian, or same gender loving, 13 cases identified as bisexual, 13 cases self-identified as heterosexual or, or straight, three cases declined to answer, and 58 others are unknown. The age range, uh, the ages range from 20 to 64 years of age with a median age of 35 years. Of the 270 cases for this time period, there have been eight hospitalizations and no deaths. About 47% of cases are white, 44% are Hispanic or Latino, and 9% are black or African American. Over half of the reported cases have been reported in the central region, which accounts for 58% of all cases. There have uh, been nine reported cases among persons experiencing homelessness. It is important uh, to continue to message that anyone can get MPOX. Blaming any one community may harm public health efforts and cause providers to miss MPOX in other people. Now, uh, the, this slide shows the epidemiology curve with a number of cases by episode date grouped by CDC week again from Sunday through Saturday. It appears that we may have seen uh, the peak in cases during the first week of August. Globally, the World Health Organization has also reported the cases uh, declined by 21% after a month-long trend of rising infections. 
This trend is also seen in data reported by the California Department of Public Health. Monitoring weekly cases will still be required to determine if there is a sustained decrease in weekly cases. And given the incubation period is up to 21 days, more cases could still be reported uh, in the gray area as outlined in this slide. Now, as you know, the county has established, has an established preparedness and response system to monitor investigate and test persons suspected of MPOX infection. Building on the COVID-19 response and successes learned from T3, this slide shows their T3 response dashboard for MPOX, uh, for the MPOX outbreak. In the week of August 21st through August 27th, there was a seven day daily average of seven confirmed and probable cases. Additionally, 217 tests were performed for the same time period. This includes both positive and negative test results as well as indeterminate or inconclusive test results. The cumulative total two or four, um, the cumulative total of MPOX tests reported is 985 tests. In terms of trace in the week of August 21st through August 27th, there were 18 new contacts identified. A total of 241 cumulative contacts have been identified to date. Currently, antiviral treatment with the medication called tecoviramat or TPOX is available through all of our six uh, HHSA geographic regions. To date, there have been almost 297 courses uh, of this medication distributed to San Diego County providers. Now in this next slide, uh, to ensure equitable access for those individuals at greatest risk of exposure, vaccination sites have been identified at hospital systems, federally qualified health centers, and our county public health clinics, where services are routinely provided to the affected population. This slide shows a map of vaccination sites uh, throughout San Diego County. There are four ways where those at highest risk can uh, obtain an MPOX uh, vaccine with vaccinations primarily by appointment only. The first is individuals can call their providers. The seco second uh, uh, way to obtain uh, uh, the vaccine is people can sign up for the county's text message alert system Simply text COSD monkeypox to 468-311 to start receiving alerts for vaccination appointment availability. Eligible individuals may book an appointment at www.myturn.ca.gov. The county also leads focused or equity focused client outreach efforts where community based organizations and our county uh, STI clinic conducts outreach to high priority individuals to schedule vaccine appointments when they are available. And lastly, the federal government has provided vaccines directly to Ryan White HIV providers, such as the Family Health Centers and uh, San Ysidro. Vaccines are also sent directly from the federal government to the Veterans Administration. Now, vaccines have been allocated in phases, and this table shows allocations from the state for phase zero through phase 3A by San Diego County provider locations. A total of 5,047 um, vials uh, were allocated to these sites through August 1st. Most of these allocations were administered through subcutaneous delivery. The county received the next allocation of 990 vials for phases 3B and 3C on August 23rd. Each vial now represents up to five doses administered via the intradermal route instead of one dose administered subcutaneously. The exception to intradermal delivery includes those less than 18 years of age or individuals with a tendency to keloid. This now means that a potential of up to 4,950 doses can be administered to eligible individuals. While it is helpful that each vial represents up to 
five doses, the vaccine supply has yet to meet the demand. It is projected that approximately 66,000 individuals meet the high risk category, with each individual needing two doses 28 days apart. This would require a total of 132,000 vaccine doses. The demand is still great, as shown yesterday by the rapid booking of 1,050 appointments for this week's county point of dispensing events, filling up in 45 minutes. As more vaccine is expected for phase four, additional vaccination events will be held. Lastly, as a continued reminder, the vaccine supply from the federal strategic national stockpile goes directly to state health departments. In California, Los Angeles gets their supply directly, and the remaining 60 local health departments obtain allocations from the state. Lo uh, allocations are based on a state formula, which can be found on the county's MPOX website. This formula is based on the number of MPOX cases as well as syphilis cases. As of August 21st, the county has requested 31,588 vials and received 6,037 vials of 19% of the request from the California Department of Public Health. 5,992 vials of uh, vaccine have been distributed uh, to our hospital systems, our federally qualified health centers, and our county clinics. 45 vials are on reserve at the county for post-exposure prophylaxis. This total represents vaccines received for phase zero through phase C. Phase four allocations are in transit. As vaccine allocations slowly increase, staff will continue to work with community partners to vaccinate those persons who are exposed and those at highest risk for exposure. Now please welcome Dr. Elizabeth Hernandez to share community outreach efforts. Thank you, Dr. Wooten. The MPOX website has been live since June 2nd, 2022, and continues to be updated with this information and resources, such as data, educational materials, communities, and healthcare professionals, as well as information and recordings for virtual town halls and telebriefings. The number of MPOX cases is updated Monday through Friday by 4 p.m., and case demographics, testing, tracing, and treatment numbers are updated weekly. The vaccine page provides information and updates regarding vaccine eligibility and availability. Vaccine allocation by phase, as well as the number of vials requested and distributed are also tracked and updated weekly. Educational materials cover disease information such as spread, transmission, signs and symptoms, cleaning and disinfecting, the difference between MPOX and COVID, prevention and steps to take if exposed or sick. Materials are available for printing as well as posting on social media and are in process of being translated in the seven threshold languages as Spanish and English materials are currently posted on the website. The County Office of Communications used an existing marketing contract to allow for MPOC social media ads and dating app ads have been developed in both English and Spanish. As of last week, county-sponsored messaging on Google, Facebook, Instagram, and LGBTQ apps and sites have resulted in over 2.3 million impressions. We are also up to almost 6,800 text message subscribers, and the MEMPOX website is the most visited on the county platform with over 90,000 views. As part of the coordination efforts related to existing activities and resources, the county has coordinated with all libraries to add the MPOX link to their websites and post flyers at their sites, conducted several community town halls, assembled and distributed a thousand hygiene kits to include band-aids and MPOX flyers, amended community contracts to conduct outreach, health education, and risk redu reduction at restaurants, bars, clubs, and other identified locations. And we're in the process of developing contracts with healthcare providers to provide MPOC services for the under or non-insured, specifically for testing, TPOX treatment, and foot team outreach and vaccinations. Chair Fletcher and members of the board, today we recommend your board to take the following action with respect to this item. Find that there is a continuing need for the local health emergency until no longer needed, subject to the California Health and Safety Code Section 101080 requirements.
Thank you for the opportunity to provide today's presentation and subject to your questions, this concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you to Dr. Wooten, uh, Hernandez, Dr. Shah, uh, Dr. Kadaki, everyone who's been involved in all of the uh, community engagement focus <clears throat> teams that are out working through this. We'll continue to press and push uh, for more vaccines and continue to do everything we possibly can every day to adapt and, uh, and meet the needs. So I'm grateful uh, for the efforts. I'm happy to make a motion uh, to approve the recommendations here. All right. Second from Supervisor Anderson. Uh, let me ask the clerk to call forward our public speakers on agenda item 18. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have 17 total requests to speak, seven in person and 10 requesting to speak by phone. Also note for the record that we received 66 e-comments, seven in favor, 55 in opposition, and one neutral. Any members of the public that requested to speak on item 18 by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers, those in favor of this item, followed by those in opposition. As your name is called, please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. I'd like, for, like to invite for the following individuals in favor, Mickey Lochner, Paul Gunn, and Samantha Schwimmer. I've called your name, please come forward. You'll have two minutes to address the board. I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. Uh, good afternoon um, to the Board of Supervisors. My name is Mikey Lochner. I am the chair of the San Diego County HIV um, planning group. I'm here today to, um, in support of this motion because I want to say for a person, I'm a long-term survivor of 36 years. 40 years ago, when AIDS first hit the country, there was no response from the government. It took the gay community to come together and go to the streets before the government finally realized that there was a problem. So we've come a long way in 40 years, and I applaud what this county has done. This Board of Supervisors, you, you guys have really stepped up to the plate, and you have really showed the community that you truly care about all of the individuals that live in San Diego County. And I ask that you continue to support this, because with the help of the Public Health Department and Health and Human Services, they now are doing, I believe, seven different phone calls during the week with different parts of the community, and they're updating the, those particular parts of the community on what's going on with monkeypox and how that, those parts of the community can work in conjunction with them, because my message at the town hall was we need to communicate clearly with each other, we need to collaborate with each other, and we need to educate ourselves, and we need to educate others. And so I um, stand here before you, I applaud you um, for stepping up to the plate, and I ask that you continue to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. My name is Samantha Schwimmer. I use um, she, they pronouns, and on behalf of the San Diego LGBT Community Center, I'm here today to urge the Board of Supervisors to approve item 18, continuing the declaration of MPOX as a public health emergency. As a health and human service provider for the San Diego LGBTQ community, we support the continued declaration of MPOX as a local health emergency because we know firsthand that this declaration will help bring additional vaccines and other resources to the region and will support with enhanced community awareness at the county as the county continues its monkeypox response efforts. These efforts are working and we need to continue them to ensure this outbreak continues to decline. With gay, bisexual, and men who have sex with men accounting for over 90% of cases in San Diego, we have seen from the data and from the lived experiences of our community members that this outbreak disproportionately affects the LGBTQ community. As, public health, as a public health crisis on this scale, this requires a multifaceted response and the public health emergency is a vital tool in providing our community with essential resources. In the absence of this local health emergency, we fear the outbreak will get worse. And as we've seen in recent years, the importance of addressing health emergencies head on is key to keeping our community safe. We are heartened by the collaboration we have had and will continue to have with the county and the San Diego Health and Human Services Agency. And I thank the supervisors in advance for their yes vote on extending the local health emergency. Thank you. Thank you. As the next speaker is coming forward, I'd like to invite the speakers in opposition of this item, Mike Borello, Audra, Paul Hankin, and Consuelo. Uh, good morning, Chair Fletcher and board. My name is Paul Gunn, and I'm a gay man representing a large number of gay men in San Diego impacted by this current outbreak. 
I'd like to note my support uh, and the support from thousands of men whom I represent for the state of emergency to continue for monkeypox. This enables us to have a better access to vaccines which are sorely needed in San Diego County and hopefully cut through any red tape that may hold up any health care action. As you already know, gay men are pleading for vaccinations and the government just hasn't provided enough in time to stop the spread in our community. As a result, our community has made a good conscientious effort to modify our behavior where we can and even to seek out vaccines out of county. Monkeypox is a gruesome virus and can manifest in different severity in different people, but the emotional suffering is relatively the same. I fielded many conversations about symptoms, testing, vaccines, treatments, and the result is the same, the stress and worry around the disease. Dismantling this state of emergency will not help that, and we count on you for your supportive action. While I am here, I would like to request that we start same-day testing appointment priority. I want any gay man to be able to pick up a phone and get a same-day test. I request that all doctors be given the tools to test lesions and, and send for testing. I request while we continue cases of monkeypox in San Diego for doctors to treat every case like possible monkeypox and other STDs second. To all the opposition to the continuation of the state of emergency, I say this, monkeypox is not COVID, San Diego County is not under threat of being shut down, and this is not on the agenda of the Board of Supervisors or the Health and Human Services. Monkeypox is 95% of the time spread by sex between two gay men. So if you don't want to get monkeypox, I suggest you simply don't have sex with a gay man. I love San Diego, and I stand here for the gay community. Thank you for your time, Mr. Fletcher, and board. Next speaker, please. Uh, uh, Paul Hinken. <clears throat> the monkeypox emergency is scam and a sham. Wilma, you should be ashamed. The emergency declaration has false and misleading statements. The HHSA website, as of August 24, lists 239 total monkeypox cases with an asterisk. The cases are confirmed monkeypox or probable orthopox viruses. The CDC lists about 30 orthopox viruses and then there are a few more, like Alaska pox. Alaska pox resembles a mosquito bite. And then in the demographics, it lists 209 cases, of 205 of which are male, and somehow it makes up 100% of the total. Not sure about the other 30 cases or how 205 is 100% of 209. 83% or 93%, I'm sorry, are in the LGD, LGBTQ crowd. Not sure if the others live close by, they probably do. And 2%, making up five cases, are actually hospitalized. This time, Alice waited patiently until it chose to spoke, speak again. In a minute or two, the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and yawned and shook itself. And he said, one side will make you grow taller and the other side will make you grow shorter. That's COVID and monkeypox. Thank you for your attention. Next speaker, please. Mike Barillo. So I'll ask the same question I asked the last meeting on monkeypox. Why now? What happened in the last two years to suppress the immune system? Just to ask yourself that question. Why now are we getting the emergence of monkeypox? But that's not why I'm here. I'm, I'm saying even if it is here, we should not be having an emergency order. Just because the state or feds do it doesn't mean San Diego has to do it. The risk of death or serious outcomes for monkeypox is little or non-existent. Besides actual cases being nil, extending the emergency order will only accomplish a state of fear. Many that fear monkeypox will vaccinate, and that could be up to 20% of the population or focused populations. Availability seems to be a concern, but those that do manage to be vaccinated with Genius are putting themselves at risk for far worse outcomes. Already in VARES, there's 276 reported adverse events. 
22 cases reported emergency room visits of nasal congestion, wheezing, headache, dizziness, fatigue, sore throat, shivers, muscle ache and high fever, lesions, swollen lymph nodes, rash, itchiness, anaphylaxis, hypertension, tachycardia, seizures, chest pain and tightness of the chest, also one case of pericarditis, 22 cases. And now we know VAERS significantly is underreported. We knew that from COVID. Reading case reports, recipients are not being told, not being informed that the vaccine has albumin in it. So those with egg sensitivity should not be taking the vaccine. It's only a short matter of time that people will unnecessarily die or become permanently disabled, just like COVID in smaller numbers. Genius is a modified smallpox vaccine. Small pack vaccines have historically killed people, also according to the VAERS record. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Use the name Audra. This is bananas. Um, it's crazy. You guys just, Jim, I feel like we're at that point in time when there's another emergency and people aren't going to buy it. Right? Man, it's really hard to listen to all this propaganda. I mean, that's what it is. It's a propaganda update, Wilma. Do you do any of your own research? No, you just get it funneled down. Um, you know, it's just, yeah, like what Mike is saying, I mean, you've been, you know, given all these vaccines and now suddenly there's an outpox, um, outbreak of pox and CDC has like skunk pox and all this BS in it. But then you say it's like, it's not sexually transmitted, uh, but it's being sexually transmitted. Hmm. And then the CDC now has like safe sex guidelines like dry humping or masturbating from a distance with your partner. But it's not sexually transmitted. That's why you guys are giving this vaccine at STD clinics, right? Hmm. Interesting, maybe if you stopped vaccinating people with deadly viruses and stuff, people would be well. But that's weird, why would you want that? I mean, you need people to die, right? I mean, if you really cared about people, you wouldn't be injecting them with stuff that you're trying to protect them from. Like, let me hit you with a car so that you don't get hit by a car. That sounds like a good idea, right? It's totally bogus. And the reason you're in this other emergency is to get more money and to just shut people's lives down. And if you really cared, you'd quit killing people and tell the truth. But you won't, because you need to get as many vaccines and as many arms as possible. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Consuelo, for the people in the back. The monkeypox emergency is a scam and a sham. Wilma, you should be ashamed. The emergency declaration has false and misleading supporting statements. The HHSA website as of August 24th lists 239 total monkeypox cases with an at risk. The cases are confirmed monkeypox or probable orthopox viruses. The CDC lists about 30 orthopox viruses, and there are a few more, like Alaska pox. Alaska pox resembles a mosquito bite. And then in the demographics, it lists 209 cases, 205 of which are male, making up 100% of the total. Not sure about the other 30 cases or how 205 is 100% of 209. 93% are in the LGBTQ crowd. Not sure if the others live closely. Oh, close by. They probably do. 2%, five cases are hospitalized. This time, okay, this is, this time Alice waited patiently until she chose to speak again. In a minute or two, the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and yawned once or twice and shook itself. Then it got down off the mushroom and crawled away in the grass, merely remarking as it went, one side will make you grow taller and the other side will make you grow shorter. That's COVID and monkeypox. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you, Paul. We'll now hear from those that requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you will be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We'll begin with our first caller. Nimisha, um, I'm opposed to this. Um, define probable. Esteemed doctors and Dr. Wilma sitting here, define probable. What does that mean? What kind of tests did you do? What kind of outcomes were you looking for? If you're going to batch up probable and actual monkeypox cases together, that's not good research. With all the salaries you pull and all of your research, is this the best you could come up with? Next thing. This is a sexually transmitted diseases from men to men. Why are we making this such a big deal? Give them the freaking monkeypox vaccination if they want it, but this is not an emergency, okay? Not even 10% of the people of San Diego are infected with it. This is bad, bad policy. Number three, how is, what does the outlook look like? How, what, what does the future look like? Because it seems like the cases are going down but you're making it look like it's a huge public, uh, public outcry and people are, are wanting to get the information and they don't have it, all the information is up there. Everybody has access to this information. The bottom line is that you want the dollars that go with it and you want these people vaccinated, but there is no choice in that. What you're doing is that you're fear-mongering and you're creating these stupid... The, the statistics are so off that... I'm surprised that you're not ashamed of what you're posting up there. It, it's horrible. Probable cases? Probable? Define probable. I'm surprised that none of you guys sitting up there in the Board of Supervisors has asked that question. I expect a little bit more for all the, the, all the taxpayer dollars that are going to the salaries. Things need to get fixed. We want accurate data, and we want accurate action plans. Otherwise, all of this money is just like... You're pimping everybody out so that you can get your dollars. That's all you are, pimp. Shame on you. Now hear from the next caller. Uh, this is Jim Ellis. Hello. You know, the board has been extending the local health emergency even though the law they use to find local emergency as the duly proclaimed existence of conditions of disaster or of extreme peril to the safety of persons and property. We, the people, have had our society and freedoms hijacked by our wayward leaders whose mandates have destroyed inalienable rights, small businesses, and lives. We shall and will not live on the terms of those obviously beholden, if not paid for, by the big pharma industry. This sham will not last. And in the end, the board will be shown that its crime against our humanity will have its natural consequences. History and a restored justice system will not be kind. Thank you. Paul Hankin, your clapping is violating the rules of Please stop. We'll now hear from the next caller. Eleanor, I'd like to talk about the money pox scam. Wilma, you should be ashamed of yourself. Have you ever thought that this money pox is a reaction to the poisonous injections you are pushing as part of your eugenics program? Does anyone with a single brain cell left actually believe in monkeypox, tomato flu, potato heebie-jeebies? What are you going to call it next to try and scare people? This is a total scam. and Nobody believes you anymore. According to Vera Sharav, a Holocaust survivor, a posse of ruthless, interconnected global billionaires have gained control over national and international policy-setting institutions. They have embarked on implementing a diabolical agenda to overthrow democracy and Western civilization, to depopulate the global population, uh, eliminate nation states, eliminate caste, and establish one digital currency and inject digital IDs and artificial intelligence capabilities into every human being. 
This is embraced by the most powerful global billionaire technocrats who gather at Davos. Big tech, big pharma, the financial oligarchs, academic government leaders, and the military-industrial complex. This time, the threat of genocide is global in scale. This time, instead of Zyklon B-gas, the weapons of mass destruction are genetically engineered injectable bioweapons masquerading as vaccines. The only emergency we have here in San Diego is that we have five globalist monkeys sitting on our board of supervisors trying to destroy the people they serve. Now hear from the next caller. Good afternoon, Chairman Fletcher, Honorable Supervisors, and Ms. Robbins-Meyer. Uh, I'm Bill York. I'm the President and CEO of 201 San Diego, and I'm pleased to come for you today to express our support of the County of San Diego's response to monkeypox and the extension of the local health emergency declaration. More than 300 team members at 211 work tirelessly to connect people every day and every night to community, health, and social disaster information in over 200 languages. The County of San Diego, 211, our community partners have a long-standing relationship working together to make sure all county residents have critical, vetted, and verified information during a crisis, such as COVID-19 and today monkeypox. 211 supports the county's commitment to our community by quickly getting information to people that needed, needed it and access the resources they need. We've done this by assisting the county with information dissemination with county's harm, harm reduction public awareness campaign and working closely with public health by providing general information support for monkeypox prevention, symptoms, and treatment, and how to access a health care provider if someone does not have one. At the beginning of the activation, 2-1 also supported the county in partnership by coordinating access and to scheduling 1,600 vaccine appointments. To date, 2-1-1 has answered more than 6,000 calls from people inquiring about monkeypox and vaccinations, and hundreds of calls continue daily. The monkeypox outbreak is rapidly advancing with community spread and requires increasing support through resources available through local health emergency declaration. By extending the local health emergency declaration, services continue to be expanded, expanded and those most vulnerable can be vaccinated, tested, and treated. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. My name is Kara. I am opposed to this. Um, I just wanted to start off by asking for Joel to please put down his phone. Joel, you've been on your phone the entire time that people have been calling in and speaking. It's rude. It's dismissive. and We're sick of it. I don't care if you're the only rhino running against whoever in your district. I don't care. We're tired of it. Jim, you too. Stop being so disrespectful and dismissive to us, your citizens and your constituents. I expect it from the other dirt bags on the board. I expect better from you too. Um, let's talk about emergencies. Hey, Nathan, you went to the San Diego Labor Council party three days ago and you posted a superhero picture with you and your disgusting wife. Um, was there an emergency that night for the party? Were you guys not scared to go and catch this then? Or how about four days ago when you and 30 other people were gathered closely for a photo op for the janitors? Or how about five days ago with the Behavior Health Workforce Symposium when the room was packed full, elbow to elbow with non-mask wearing individuals? Aren't you guys scared about money pox? Or I'm sorry, is it end pox? Or is it monkey pox? I, it's really hard for me to keep track of all of the different bullshit names you guys are deciding to call this. Um, also, the county crisis that we're all experiencing is each and every single one of you there on the board. You're all committing fraud. You will all be held account. There will be an audit. You'll be fired. You'll be in jail. Nuremberg 2.0, the list goes on. I could literally go on for hours about it. Shame on all of you. Jim, Joel, I'll continue to post on your Facebooks until you start paying attention at these meetings. Shame on both of you. Now here from the next caller. Mr. Hank, and the rules are really clear. There's no clapping or applauding during the meeting. These are the rules of procedure. These are the rules of procedure. Your outburst is violating the conduct of the meetings who rose behind him. It's your first warning. You're going to follow the rules or you're going to leave. That's it. Now, Consuelo, that's your second warning. You get one more, you'll be gone. We will clear the chambers, have you removed, and let everyone who wants to follow the rules back in. But we're not doing this the rest of the meeting. 
I want you to stay in the meeting and be here, but we are going to follow the rules. Is everyone clear? Audra, outburst, violate one, one. Next speaker, please. Of course it's my turn. This is truth. M stands for money. Nathan's money pox monkey business. Wilma, nice to see you accept the memo about money pox being a racist name. An order from your bosses at the WHO. How obedient. But I suggest we all just stick with Nathan's ingenious idea of calling it money pox. It's perfect for the COVID poppy script we're all being subjected to, where there are zero deaths and some probable cases of an illness less transmissible than COVID that can heal in only two weeks. But you supervisors keep collecting more emergency checks and powers. You know, the opposite of checks and balances that we should have in our constitutional republic. Just because King Gruesome declared a state of emergency doesn't mean that any of you monkey supervisors have to go along for the ride. But you can't help yourself, can you? On May 19th, when Paul Hinken pointed out that the population of San Diego County was decreasing, and thus there'd be less taxes available for the supervisors to spend. Well, I figured out why the budget didn't really change. Nathan's money pox is supposed to bring in more federal funds. Come on. You supervisors don't have to be bananas for more money. You can dump Wilma of the West over there and strip her of her undeserved pedestal any time. Just try throwing some holy water on her or something. You perfect rat! Look what you've done! Chair Fletcher, that concludes public comment on this item. All right, we have a motion by myself, second by Supervisor Anderson. To those speakers who came down here today, I want you to know your county takes this seriously. Uh, we uh, are doing everything that we can. Um, I think there's a point at which uh, you can grow kind of immune to, to some of the, the stuff that you hear here, but I know when you visit for the first time, it can be a little jarring. Uh, but I want you to know your board supports you and supports our community and is doing everything we can to keep people safe and protect them. Uh, and we will continue to do that. And I want you to know that the overwhelming majority of San Diegans feel exactly the same. Uh, so please, as you go back into your community, take heart and know uh, that we take this serious. We acknowledge the way in the past things had not been dealt the same way. Uh, and we're going to continue to do everything we can as we move forward. So don't be discouraged or disheartened at all um, from any of this. No, we'll keep doing everything that we can. Uh, we have a motion by myself, second by Supervisor Anderson. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. We're going to go to agenda item number 19, notice to public hearing. I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second by Vice Chair Vargas. Please call forward the speakers on item 19. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have six requests to speak on item 19, two in person and four by phone. Also note for the record that we did not receive any e-comments on this item. For the individuals that requested to speak by phone on item 19, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers. Both are in opposition to this item. I'd like to invite forward Audra and Paul Hankin. You'll have two minutes to address the board. Hi, Paul Hinken. Once again, we have public money going to a religious institution. No matter how accepting the institution is of the public and of the good it does, the fact remains that people of another religion probably won't like a music and worship or Christian studies BA. These can produce great things but not for everyone and not in school. Just think how the Afghan refugees you mentioned in item 17 feel about their new lesson in constitutional ethics, separation of church and state, 
and how welcome they would they be at Point Loma Nazarene with their customary dishes and eating habits, their separation of the sexes in school, and their prayers five times a day, and pardon me if I stereotype anyone. It is pretty clear that the equity you mentioned does not apply to all equally. So let's keep within the law and separate church and state. Uh, also, Nathan, I'd like to point out that uh, polite clapping for a second between speakers is not disrupting the conduct of the meeting. Please reread your rules. Thank you for your attention. Next speaker, please. Use the name Audra. Oh, it's just about money with you guys, and um, I'm surprised you have some ARPA money left. It's interesting, because you guys love to spend it, but yet you are seeking more funding always. It's like you'll get your money and then be like, we need to seek more of it so that we can spend it on everything. That's why we're in this other emergency gym, right? I mean, because you wouldn't have been able to spend your $1.2 million on the communities, right? I mean, so is that why you want to keep us in this state, even though it destroys people's lives? So we just want to keep getting funding. That's We're already giving the funding. The funding comes from the people. And then it's like, you guys are never inclusive with stuff. You actually exclude all of us here. The way you talk to them, like, thank you for coming in. F you to those that don't agree. Like, you're never, you don't include us. Like, we are like a whole class of people that you basically just dismiss. Yet you sit there and talk about equal shit all the time. It's crazy, because it's like, I mean, would you do that to, I mean, yeah, I don't even know. It's just frustrating, because you guys are spending our money, and what you guys use it on is totally bullshit. And you're killing people with vaccines, so it's like, we're paying for you to do that too. This item's not about vaccines. It's about it's ARPA. About That's COVID hearing, money. Topic, it's COVID money. It is Nathan. not. It is not. It's a COVID of money. Hearing, ARPA funds. Why? Why was that put into play? You ought to be here enough to realize what item. Are we're you on. fucking kidding? I ought to be here to know what you know. You're on the wrong item, Audra. We're on 19. Oh my Notice gosh. We are. <laughs> yeah, try again next time. Time's up. Next speaker. <gasps> no, it isn't. I still had time. We'll Next speaker. Hear, we'll now hear from those that requested to speak by phone. Mi nombre es Truth. What's that for Truth, Dayo? Day Norachan. Hi, yo. That's my home to no superpower at this point. I'm all like a El Caranaina. I'm not going to talk about English or anything. Not so gengo. I'm a new go hanashi. Hatsuki no jinana hini. ホームセーフのスタッフを私のスペンゴマンゼットを翻訳しないだからでもこの項目について would anyone like a free translation? I mean, the county staff won't do it for me. If I translate into English, is it off topic if I already said it in another language? I don't know. But I won't translate it all, just some. So here you go. Nora, good morning. This is my real superpower. Do you remember what you said about Bilingual people having a superpower? Well, this is my third language now. You don't understand? It's not Spanish, is it? On August 17th, the staff refused to translate my speech that I said in Spanish. Horrible, right? Anyway, about this item, loans are always a bad thing. But I do like that the county could make about $1,000 via approval in translation. The rest is a secret. You supervisors can ask your translators to work on it if you're curious. Not my problem. Matane. And Chair Fletcher, that concludes public comment on this item. We have a motion by myself, seconded by Vice Chair Vargas. Please vote. 
Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. We're going to go to agenda item number 20, an item related to ARPA funding. We're going to have a staff presentation, and uh, after that, we will hear from our uh, public speakers on this item and then come back to the board for discussion. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. Today I'm here with the HHSA Executive Finance Director, Amy Thompson, to provide your board with an update on spending of the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, the framework that was approved last summer. After ARPA was signed into law, in preparation for the receipt of its allocation, the county held community workshops and the board weighed in on programs to support with ARPA funding. With this input, the board approved the ARPA framework in June of last year, 2021. The ARPA framework has given our county the flexibility to test, treat, and trace COVID-19 cases, provide food assistance to our most needy, grants to small businesses and nonprofits negatively impacted by the pandemic, and much more. With ARPA enacted, it provides relief of the impacts of COVID-19, providing funding to support responding to the COVID-19 public health emergency, assisting those that were negatively impacted by COVID-19 through direct stimulus payments or programs, replacing revenue losses experienced by governmental agencies, or what is referred to as lost revenue, paying premiums for essential workers, as well as investing in public infrastructure. In April, the staff, county staff met with the Board of Supervisors Finance Subcommittee and was directed to evaluate the ARPA framework to identify strategies to leverage ARPA resources, to glide slope or extend programs scheduled to sunset following the ARPA eligibility period, which is bringing us to today's discussion here. As you're aware, the ARPA framework included $653.5 million for programs that supported the COVID-19 response, premium pay for essential workers, mental health services, homeless services, and a variety of direct stimulus payments, and much more with the major frameworks components listed on this slide. After meeting with the financial subcommittee this month, the county staff prepared this update to present projected spending and remaining balances in a manner that was requested by the subcommittee. Through the end of this fiscal year that just ended in June, we have spent approximately $233 million. And you'll note that the county expects to spend an additional $300 million, $301 million through fiscal year 24-25 totaling $534 million in estimated spending through fiscal year 24-25, leaving $119 million for future spending. Included in these amounts are projected cost savings of $48.3 million, which includes balances from the COVID response, premium pay and restaurant fee waivers, and a component of the small business stimulus as described in the board letter. Today's action from the full board will provide direction to the chief administrative officer on how to use the cost savings of ARPA funding, as well as any other amounts of planned future spending, for example, the $119 million that the board may direct. Several options are being presented today for your consideration. We will provide additional detail of the recommendations for action in the next few slides, but in short, Staff is requesting direction today on one of two options regarding the ARPA framework and direction on using a portion of these funds towards the establishment of a fund for a long-term community programs. Recommendation two would direct staff to return using the assumption that we move forward with the amounts allocated in the existing ARPA framework as approved by your board in June of last year and provide recommendations on how to allocate the projected cost savings. Recommendation 2B would direct staff to return with options to revise the existing framework, which would not only include direction to staff on what to do with the projected cost savings, but also direction on how to reprioritize um, pro programs within the existing framework, which may allow for extending the life of certain programs, for example. 
Recommendation three is a consideration for all or a portion of the remaining or reallocated ARPA funding to create a fund to support long-term benefit programs in the region based on leveraging certain funding sources. And so we'll take a closer look at these options on the next few slides. Amy Thompson will walk us through these options and I'll note that we do have staff here available in the chamber ready to answer questions regarding these options and discuss implications to potential revisions uh, to the framework following the conclusion of this presentation. Amy. Thank you, Avani. Option 2A, if selected, would continue with the approved ARPA framework spending plan consistent with the framework previously adopted by the board on June 8th of 2021. All projects would move forward as planned. There is currently a projected cost savings of just over $48 million that would be available from previously approved projects at the end of the ARPA period. County staff would return to the board within 30 days to provide recommendations to allocate the $48 million in projected cost savings. All funds would be obligated by fiscal year 24-25, though actual spending may continue past that time. As an alternative to option 2A, the board may elect to revise the current ARPA framework, which is option 2B. Option 2B differs from 2A in that the board may choose to reprioritize the programs within the ARPA framework in addition to reallocating any projected cost savings. This could mean removing a program that is not yet operational from the framework altogether or keeping certain programs in at revised amounts. Any dollars freed up could be redirected to other areas, including a redirection to expand funding sources for ongoing ARPA-related programs expected to continue past the ARPA grant period. Under this option, the board would provide direction to staff on specific reallocations, direct county staff to return to the board within 30 days with recommendations and a plan or a combination of both of these. And lastly, besides the board's decision on option 2A or option 2B, the board is requested to provide direction on exploring the feasibility of establishing a fund to support long-term benefit programs within the region. This could initially be funded by projected cost savings under option 2A or reprioritization of ARPA funding under option 2B. It's contemplated that these amounts would be leveraged to access matching funds, donations, grants, or other funds, and could also be structured to be a self-sustaining funding source. Impact funds that have been established by other agencies that may be used as a reference include the following. In Illinois, Cook County's equity fund was established in 2021 with $40 million to address structural barriers and to best serve Cook County residents through grant making and community engagement. The state of Indiana is using $10 million of ARPA leveraged funding to provide matching grants to cities and towns for investments to help increase transparency and further accountability of their law enforcement agencies. If the board chooses to move forward with recommendation three, direction is requested on how much ARPA funding should be leveraged for that fund. Recommendation three would utilize an ARPA lost revenue strategy in order to free up previously allocated general purpose revenue to establish the fund. As a note, future staff recommendations under any of the options presented today will include implementation of an ARPA lost revenue strategy as allowed under the US Treasury final ARPA guidance in order to maximize cost recovery options for items in the framework that may be difficult to otherwise claim. This would also provide for increased flexibility in program delivery. If the board moves forward with recommendation three, county staff would return within 180 days with recommendations and a plan to establish the fund. I'll now turn the presentation back over to Ebony. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, to wrap up today's recommended actions before your board, they are to receive the update on the ARPA framework related to projected spending on ARPA frameworks, provide direction to either continue with the approved ARPA framework or to revise the framework, which may extend the length of time for some ARPA programs, direct the CAO to explore creating a fund to support long-term regional benefit programs with the leverage funding source. This completes staff's prepared comments for this item and we're welcome for further discussion, direction, or questions. Thank you. Let's hear from our public speakers and then we'll come back for board discussion. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have 15 requests to speak on item 29 in person and six by phone. Also note for the record that we received 15 e-comments, five in favor and eight opposition and one neutral. 
Any members of the public that requested to speak in item 20 by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers, uh, starting with those in favor of this item. As your name is called, please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. I'd like to invite forward Chris Olson, Doug Moore, Yesenia DeCasas, and Sabrina Bishop. You'll have two minutes to address the board, and I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. Good afternoon, Chair Fletcher and Supervisors. I'm Chris Olson, Chief of Staff at Jewish Family Service of San Diego. JFS is here to support the acceptance of the ARPA framework as designated in 2021, specifically the Innovations in Foster Care Program. Direct cash assistance, proven to uplift communities around the country, is an integral part of the county's overall comprehensive strategy to assist our community in recovering from the pandemic. The Innovations in Foster Care program is unique as a direct cash program because it's an upstream solution focused on addressing risk factors for child maltreatment. The program and the data it would provide over multiple years would assist the county in shifting supports for children and families toward reducing risk factors before families become involved with CWS. We already know that 42% of CWS hotline calls are general neglect calls. 47% of which are referred to access other community services. Research shows that as economic instability increases, the risk factors for child wel welfare intervention and family separation increase too. Conversely, there's a correlation between the amount of money a family receives from programs like CalWORKs and decreased reports of neglect and CWS intervention. It comes down to this. Targeted cash supports are correlated with decreased child protection activity. JFS urges the board to maintain funding for the Innovations in Foster Care program because it will reduce child maltreatment and reduce costs to the overall foster care system. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, um, Chair and members of the board. My name is Yesenia de Casaus, and I am the Assistant Director of Internal Operations for the UDW, AFSCME Local 3930. And I'm here on behalf of more than 31,000 San Diego and IHSS providers who have risked their lives and put their families' health at stake to care for our county seniors and people with disabilities during the pandemic, and they continue to do so today. We're here today to speak on this item because you have a decision to make about the recommendations in front of you. Under recommendation number two, we're asking the board to opt for option B and revisit the ARPA framework by providing direction on the reallocation of funds towards the IHSS program. Although we appreciate the allocation to expand access to telehealth for IHSS providers by using these funds, a lot more help is needed here. When you allocate funds for the IHSS program, you're essentially checking all the boxes for the intended use of these funds. The IHSS workforce represents the largest group of underrepresented, low-income, mostly women, struggling to make ends meet here in San Diego. By investing in this program, you also help the consumers that, that we take care of who are the most vulnerable seniors and people with disabilities in the county. You can use some of these ARPA funds to expand access to healthcare even more than you intend to by exploring how these funds can be used to draw some state and federal funds permanently by increasing the supplemental wage and benefit package of IHSS providers. Also, the framework, framework intends to provide assistance to populations that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. This workforce showed up in the front lines every day during the pandemic, but never received hazard pay like other county workers did. IHSS providers were not, may I just wrap up? IHSS providers were not included in the distribution of hazard pay, even though they're still trying to recuperate from the pandemic. Yet we are in the front lines. Thank you. And, Thank you. Um, Thank you know, we, we just uh, urge you to. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Up for Thank option you. B Appreciate and ensure speaker. that that direction is given. Thank you, Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Sabrina Bishop and I am an IHSS provider 
and also a UDW member. And I wanna say thank you to the chair and all of the board members today. A pay raise for our IHSS providers will help us keep doing the great work that we're doing. An increase to our health and welfare fund would recognize the need and take care, will recognize our need to take care of ourselves as we take care of our clients, which are the most vulnerable individuals in our county. As you know, a raise for care providers pay. You will also be putting needed money into our local economies, leading to stronger small businesses and stronger communities. As we make a plan for the remaining ARPA funds, the San Diego County's budget, we hope you prioritize the work that we do to ensure that our county can care for those who want to remain at home safely. According to our most recent state audit, 1.5 million hours, 1.5 million authorized hours have gone unpaid because we don't have providers to assist those clients because we can't keep them for $15.50 an hour. We are supporting some of the most vulnerable people in our community and as IHSS providers, we think and believe we deserve a better fair share of pay so that we can continue to take only not only your family and friends and relatives, but ours too. Thank you so much for considering us. Have a great day. As the next speaker is coming forward, I'd like to invite the speakers in opposition of this item, Oliver Twist, Mike Borello, Audra, Michael Brando, and Paul Hankin. Good afternoon. My name is Doug Moore and I'm the executive director of UDW ASPME Local 3930. We represent over 145,000 IHSS providers across the state of California and over 31,000 right here in San Diego County. San Diego is in the midst of a long-term care crisis and you can solve this crisis right now with the remaining American Rescue Plan Act funds. When the pandemic hit, our members took to the front lines to protect the county's seniors and people with disabilities, keeping them out of hospitals and nursing homes where COVID ran rapid. And they did so without access to PPE and other important protections. We had to fight for those. But the care crisis is ultimately about the clients our members serve. And even before the pandemic, millions of IHSS hours were going unmet each year. An audit released by the state of by the state in 2021 found that over 2,000 IHSS recipients in San Diego County do not receive the care they are assessed due to the shortage of care providers. We need to address this gap right now. Thankfully, the solution to the, to the care provider shortage is simple. It's not rocket science. It's better wages and benefits. IHSS providers in San Diego County are not being paid a living wage. They survive off of $15.50 an hour when the county's average living wage for a single adult is $22 and double or triple that of for working families. Low wages combined with an increased cost of living make it nearly impossible for caregivers to remain in this field and even more difficult to recruit new caregivers. Friends, you hold the solution to this crisis in your hands. Who needs support more than the providers who keep our neighbors and loved ones safe? Who needs it more than our community seniors and people with disabilities who are only asking that their care needs be met with dignity and compassion? Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, good afternoon, Oliver Twist here. And because I believe in equality, I will read into the record also that Tara Lawson Reamer returned about 25 minutes late from lunch. I also want to speak um, about the double standard of letting somebody else, I absolutely think you should have let her finish. I just think that standard needs to be applied equally to everybody. So please in the future. Um, and then lastly, I strongly, strongly support IHSS. They need a raise. The work they do is really God's work at the deep
deepest level, 20 bucks an hour minimum for them, and, and if not more, so support them. Um, as far as the ARPA, I kind of feel like this is like the Padre game when you go at the beginning and they have the shell under the hat and then they mix it all around. And this reallocation concerns me because I don't think you've been good stewards or there's not oversight in place, sufficient oversight for the money that you do get. I'm really concerned about that VOA Southwest and the money that's having to go into that to refix that building, that that was not a good use um, and that we were 277,000 defrauded on that exchange for the building you are getting. Um, also, lastly, I found what other things that this ARPA money could be used for, um, such, and this is from a, a civil engineer website. Uh, they say recipients may transfer funds to a private nonprofit organization, a public benefit corporation involved in the transportation of passengers or cargo. Imagine taking everybody to their medical appointment or giving kids, you know, rides to after school sports uh, things that are not served by public transportation. Um, recipients may use the funds for direct stimulus payments to residents or rebates on property taxes. That would really counter the inflation going on. May increase wage for essential workers, um, example, $10 per hour for 90 days. So let's, let's get them up to 20 bucks an hour at least minimum and maybe look at 25. Um, these are just a few things I have concerns. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Hi, Paul Hinken. For the U.S. Treasury's fact sheet, ARPA funds may be used to support urgent COVID-19 response efforts to continue to decrease the spread of the virus, replace lost public sector funds or revenues to support vital public services and help retain jobs, support immediate economic stabilization for households and businesses, and address systemic public uh, challenges that have contributed to COVID's unequal impact. It almost sounds like you guys thought the ARPA money would be unrestricted. Some of the projects you put in the agenda have little to do or nothing to do with immediate economic stabilization due to COVID. Expansion of an incentive program. Expansion is a future thing, not, and has little to do with immediate stabilization. Nutrition incentives beyond SNAP. Incentives are things like future discounts, not immediate. No cost transportation. Transportation cannot be in the past and is therefore not immediate. Child care vouchers for targeted populations, a great cause, but vouchers are generally for future use, not immediate. Uh, these are not public uses, and they do not fall into the category of supporting immediate economic stabilization for households and businesses. Uh, the ARPA frame up frame, framework, I mean, ha needs to be revamped. Thank you for your attention. Use the name Audra. I'll get it right this time. People make mistakes. Whoops. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's just interesting that they have to come here and ask for more money when you're saying that you're giving premium pay or like hazard pay to workers. Why aren't they getting it? Why do they have to ask for it? Who's the one that decides who's essential? You guys aren't essential. I know that, but uh, whatever. Um, but the fact that you want to create a fund to spend the money later how much later? Like that doesn't, then that wouldn't even have, would be used, that would mean that the ARPA funds would be misused, which you're already misusing anyway. Like I was saying before, Jim, you love to spend money, so you gotta keep us in this emergency. But if you're not gonna get rid of all, it's like, why do you seek more funding than if you have this funding too? Hmm? Because you guys just love money? I don't know, it does smell like sulfur in here. It's 
pretty strong smell. It's pretty hot too. Because I know where you guys have sold your souls to. And if you actually really wanted to help things, you wouldn't make people lose their jobs, die from getting these shots, have to leave. Oh, well, we pay you to do it. It's so great. It's so fantastic. I just hope one day that you guys can like turn around and go the other way and make decisions that are actually gonna help people and not destroy their lives. Because you spend over a billion dollars on COVID so far of our money. And look at the state we're in. It's like you do this and nothing gets better. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mike Barello. So there seems to be a concerted effort by the forces in Washington, D.C. and our state capital to intentionally crash our nation's economy. It's happening in all states, including California and the communities here in San Diego County. It goes all the way down to city level. And part of this is spending, the spending uh, through ARPA funds and distribution of so much money you don't know what to do with it. And you're kind of left with that situation now. You've got all this money coming out of yours. Where do you spend it, right? Okay, suggestion. Pay off your COVID bills and then send that money back to Washington. Okay, just send it back to Washington. You know, if everybody did that, our economy might start heading in the right direction. Why not? You consider that at all? So there's no emergencies in the county of San Diego other than runaway leadership and mismanagement of our tax dollars. Like the colonists that protested our right of independence, we too have the right of proper rep representation. I do not consent to tyranny, tyranny. I ask that you end this chain of corruption and graft, cease and desist, say no to the illegitimate money. What do you think, Jim? You, you're going to vote no at least on this one? You're voting yes on everything else. Too close to election? Next speaker, please. I used the name Michael. Nathan, do not interrupt me. I've got several things that all tie together to this AR. ARP, oh, you look so cute, Nathan. Smiling there, grinning, dressing up like Superman on Instagram, showing everybody how powerful you are. Okay, ARPA, AR, ARPA. <laughs> okay, um, this all ties together. You know, if something, if a story, if stories are built on an original story and the original story is a deception, a fraud, then everything else that stems from that foundational fraud is also a lie. And, you know, and that goes to this whole ARPA framework, which you money-hungry narcissists are just, oh, just so anxious to... Uh, spend and say, look at, look at us, we're such heroes, we're such heroes. You know, in this document, it said the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on the lives of individuals, businesses, and communities across San Diego County. Well, no kidding, but it actually had nothing to do with health. It had to do with people like you, Nick Mascioni, Wilma Wooten, Eric McDonald, Tony Fauci, Bill Gates, Donald Trump, Nathan Fletcher, Jim Desmond, all of you going along with this nonsense. It was you that caused the problem, and now you want to step in and say, oh, we've got all this money to spend to make everybody's lives so happy. Everyone is seeing through this, and that's why you're becoming more and more irrelevant. I am so glad we got to see Nathan smiling. Superman, Nathan Fletcher, hero, Jim Desmond. Have a good day. Bye. We'll now hear from those that requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you will be unmuted and you'll hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I would remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We'll begin with our first caller. Good 
Good afternoon, Chair Fletcher and Honorable Supervisors. This is Courtney Baltiski with the YMCA of San Diego County. As an agency dedicated to supporting children, youth, and their families with a focus on improving systems that impact them, it's been an honor to shepherd the San Diego County Partners in Prevention work. Partners in Prevention Initiative utilizes a public health and collective impact approach with over 80 partners in the San Diego community highly informed by the Strengthening Families Framework as well as trauma-informed care and culturally responsive practice. A protective factor within the Strengthening Families Framework is critical resources in a time of need. The intention of the Innovations in Foster Care Program meets this protective factor through the establishment of a direct cash program. Direct cash assistance proven to uplift communities around the country is an integral part of the county's overall comprehensive strategy to assist our community in the economic recovery from the pandemic. This program and the data it would provide over multiple years would assist the county in shifting supports for children and family towards reducing risk factors before families become involved in CWS. Recent studies have shown that targeted cash supports are correlated with decreased child protection activity. Maintaining this funding for innovations in foster care program will reduce child maltreatment and help families thrive. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. Eleanor, excerpt from Vera Sharab, Holocaust survivor. The Holocaust serves as the archetypal symbol of unmitigated evil. It did not begin in the guest chambers of Auschwitz and Treblinka. The Holocaust was preceded by nine years of incremental restrictions on personal freedom and the suspension of legal rights and civil rights. The real viral disease that infected Nazi Germany is eugenic. Medicine was perverted from its healing mission and was weaponized. Um, the moral significance of the Nuremberg Code cannot be overstated. The Nuremberg Code rejects the ideology of eugenics. The genocidal culture that permeated the Nazi regime did not end in 1945. It metastasized in the United States. At the end of the war, the U.S. government helped 1,600 high-ranking Nazi scientists, doctors, and engineers evade justice at Nuremberg. The COVID pandemic is being exploited as an opportunity to overturn the moral and legal parameters laid down by the Nuremberg Code. Humanity is currently under siege by the global heirs of the Nazi. The ultimate goal of this megalomaniac is to gain total control of the world's natural resources, financial resources, and to replace humans with transhuman robots. This is the new eugenics. Transhumanism is a biotech-enhanced caste system. Um, these megalomaniacs have paved the road to another holocaust. This time there will be no rescuers unless all of us resist. Never again is now. Wake up, everybody. We are all part of the human race. We will not be divided and conquered. And our Board of Supervisors, as well as many others, will definitely be tried for crimes against humanity. Thank you. Now hear from the next caller. Nora, you enjoyed my last speech, huh? Borello, you were dead on. I noticed that this item has a mistake in the title. Allow me to offer up a correction. This is the American Destruction Plan Act. Isn't that more accurate? Now about the one who listens, but still issued that proclamation of local emergency regarding COVID-19. That's the CAO, Helen. Everyone be sure to give her her, boo, her proper due boo credit for helping shut down our lives. It's important to note that that action resulted in the state and the county receiving nearly $650 million in inflation funny money to further push the country into debt. Because we can all see it sure hasn't made things better. Look how many people have lost their businesses or are barely holding on right now. Intentional destruction. But how long will it go on? Well, the item says the funds will be obligated by 2024 through 2025. Apparently, we've got at least three more years of these COVID checks and lies. And there will be $40 million in direct 
socialist cash payments to certain hand-chosen people, including low-income immigrants and youth in foster care. We don't know who the hand-chosen are. I'm sure it involves discrimination. If you really listen, Helen, like you claim during, for example, the June 28th budget meeting, then why don't you listen to all the people of San Diego County who've spoken against this item every single time it comes up and just refuse to allocate the funds for once in your career? Helen, you could be the wrench in the gear rather than a useless, replaceable cog in the machine. Think about that. Chair Fletcher, that concludes public comment on this item. All right, thank you. Can we pull uh, slide three up? Um, so as a board, I mean, we've got a couple choices to make. Um, let's see if we can bring slide three up on the screen for us here. We'll give them a second. Um, you know, there's a number of different options there. I, I think one thing that, that we can consider is we, you know, we have a little bit of remaining available balance. We also have some programs that have not started and we have some that are projected to go uh, beyond fiscal year 24-25. Um, if we take a look at this one, so if, if we if, if we if we look at this one and we take the remaining years that are beyond 24, 25, and we kind of swept some of those expenditures. Now, some of those we may want to put some money back into, right? But I'm just saying, if we were to sweep those, not start the things we started, then that would leave you with 119. A million dollar balance that the board could reallocate. And I suspect when we hear from everyone, there will be some desires to do some of those and put some of those back. But whatever amount we get to um, as a leftover reserve, I do think that there's some opportunities where we can invest as a board, uh, where we can take this one time funding and create some renewable uh, programs that can live forever, programs that could live for 50, 60, 70, maybe even 100 years. Uh, our behavioral health uh, workforce group. Uh, spent a year and had come up with some really creative efforts where, you know, somebody has, has debt from getting their training and they pay it back, but they pay back a percentage of what they make. And that induces them to come into Medi-Cal lives. That induces them to come and work in our jails or, or work in our foster care system. They're still paying it back. But over time, if they leave and go to private pay and make more than that percentage of what they make, then they pay back more. But again, every dollar that gets, gets used in that program is a dollar that comes back. I think there's some creative ideas around housing. Uh, they could do much the same, where again, we could take one times funds and create some renewable um, efforts and, and things that we could do. So, you know, I think as a board, we want to hear first, kind of looking here, you know, what are things, uh, you know, we're kind of comfortable sweeping some of those and using those. What are some things we'd like to do? We've heard some community issues that we would like to do. And then I think when we end up trying to land the plane as best we can on that, then we can come in and have a conversation about some of these renewable type efforts and funds. Uh, that we could work on a little bit. So I'm going to stop talking. I think we'll go through uh, board members, just give everyone a chance to kind of share thoughts, observations, directions, where we would like to go, um, and then see if we can uh, if we can bring it all together in a motion when we're done. So we'll start with Supervisor Watson Reamer. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Fletcher. That was a, a very helpful tee up. I just I would love to start with a couple questions to staff and then share some initial thoughts just to kind of kick us off. Um, uh, so Helen, I, I don't know if our team is here, but I had a couple questions on some of the programs. Um, that haven't yet started and just wanted to better understand. I, I, I do think the idea of a sustaining fund that can renew itself, that we have you know, a, a pot of money that um, <clears throat> we can invest in the community but that comes back and, and renews itself over time is a great idea. I'd love for us to figure out how to have some real money there uh, to do that. Um, and I think one of the most, obviously one of the biggest pots of money where that would come from would be Looks like there's about 40 million in in uh, programs that have not yet started, so we'd have to probably cut some of that 40 and uh, or you know and allocate it to the sustaining fund. So I just wanted to better understand those programs, um, so we could you know make sure that uh, we know what's sort of the bare minimum necessary to to fund them. Um, so I, I think maybe starting with innovations in foster youth. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, Kim is here, so why don't you come on down? Um, we. Just so you remember, uh, attachment A is attached to the board letter, and so you'll see the breakdown of that 40 million. And Kim, you're going to address the first 15 million then on the youth, the foster. Sure, happy to do so. So the uh, original amount in the innovations in foster care program was 15 million. 
uh, with that amount, uh, we could serve about 600 families uh, in that program where families would get cash disbursements for about two years and then follow them for another two years uh, to conduct an evaluation to see what the outcomes are for that program. Um, so just sort of like back of the envelope, if say we cut, if we cut everything in half, right? If we went from 40 to 20 sort of across the board and that, I guess that would 15 to, to 7.5. Um, what would that leave us being able to do? Just one, one quick point of clarification. Kim's only talking about 15 of the 40. Yep, exactly. Yeah, she's only talking about the other. Correct, the other correct. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So, sorry, just to clarify. So, there's 40 in that bucket of direct stimulus, and um, about 25 is for uh, communities uh, uh, most significantly impacted by COVID and our immigrant um, communities that were not eligible for the initial round. And then 15 was for the foster youth program. So I would just sort of, just as like a, again, just to kind of jump off a conversation, if if we were really serious about the sustaining fund and we wanted to can make sure that these investments in our immigrant communities and communities of concern and our foster youth did happen, uh, but we might not be able to fund them at the level of the 40, I just wanted to basically just focusing on starting on the foster youth, um, just kind of better understanding from you, you know, if let's say we cut that in half, we cut all that in half, and so there was 7.5 instead of 15, uh, what would that look like? So if we were to do that, we could probably serve about 400-ish families, 400, 450 families, but that wouldn't include any cost of evaluation, which had been included in the original amount. Um, I've spoken, uh, we, we could potentially do the evaluation in-house with our Office of Evaluation and Research. Um, just need to be clear that that, that seven and a half million to serve 400 to 450 families would not include the cost of the evaluation. So uh, let, me, let me just jump in. I think I might be able to clarify this. It's scalable, basically. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you think as a minimum it would be about 250 families just to keep the program viable? Is that correct? Um, we yes, we could serve 250 families. So that um, would be the minimum, and you could scale that up depending on the amount of money that you would want to put into this. I'm correct. not trying to put words in your mouth. I just want to make sure it's clear that this is scaled. Well, I, I think so. Th sorry, I don't want us to go down a rabbit hole because I have a ton of questions. I just want to focus on like I think initially, uh, the idea was to make sure that we really had like a robust study, right? It wasn't just number of families, but we had like uh, sufficient power for the for the. The research and so and I but I do want us to kind of figure out how to end up with a sustaining fund so I'm kind of trying to trying to get to like how doable is that like if we did seven and a half instead of 15 yeah. and we had like 400 450 families is that sort of enough I mean is Ricardo here I believe he is sorry again not to go down a rabbit hole but just kind of get greater clarity I think the, I want to make sure I understand the question. So the question is for seven and a half million, how many families could we serve? And is that and a good enough data study? Point, and do, is, the, is it enough to then provide a good data evaluation? Exactly. Uh, uh, Chair Fletcher, members of the board, I'm Ricardo Basurta Davila, the county's chief evaluation officer. It's a, uh, well, I'll first talk to the feasibility of uh, our office doing the evaluation. Uh, we have, funding from ARPA, our office dedicated to evaluate ARPA programs. So we don't need separate funding to do this or other evaluations of ARPA programs. So in that sense, we, we certainly could do it. It's part of the work, and that's why that funding was given to us. Um, in terms of statistical power, it's a little, it's difficult to answer the question because uh, that requires uh, calculation by a, st by a statistician on how many people will be in the treatment group, how many people will be in the control group, and then uh, what kinds of effects, uh, impacts we're expecting from the program. Uh, all I can tell you is that 400 is better than 250 and 600 is better than 400 from a researcher's perspective. Obviously, in terms of the funding available and uh, you know, the, the, the better uses of the funding, I think that is obviously better for you to decide. But um, um, I do think I was I was worried when I heard the number 250 is usually, um, you know, is when, when we usually start touching the lower limits of being able to detect the impacts of a program, and so, uh, you know, if if it is possible to have a larger number of people, this being an innovation in particular, our office was created to uh, give you information on the decisions that you make and the impact that they have, and for an innovative program, having a good sample size 
is particularly important because then we will know we may be the first ones doing this kind of work. And uh, if there is no evidence from other places on the impacts of the program, then we may be the ones informing not only you but others on, uh, on the benefits, potential benefits of the program, if indeed that's, that's what we find. So I'm sorry, it's an unsatisfactory answer to the pro, but I don't want to guess, make it. No, guesses. I think it was very clear. <laughs> uh, 600 is better than 400, and 400 is better than 250. So <laughs> thank From you. a researcher's perspective, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, that was very helpful. Um, I, and I, 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 I think from my point of view, this is a program I'm really passionate about. So, you know, I, I want to make sure that this does get adequately funded. And if I'm hearing from you guys, you know, 750, 7.5 is sort of going to work. I would, I'd be sort of willing to look at how do we cut the 40 to 20 as kind of something I'm, I'm open to. Um, as, and as part of that, I'm just kind of exploring, I'm just, you know, sharing thoughts. Um, you know, I think I want to make sure we can uh, do something uh, for our, um, you know, our community of IHSS workers. I think that was really important. Um, I heard that. And, you know, I, you know, I think that a lot, there's going to be obviously significant uh, conversations over the coming months about how we more fairly uh, treat and um, compensate our IHSS community of care and our workers, um, and I'm really looking forward to that. And I think most, a lot of those concerns are going to be addressed in the, in the context of those conversations. But um, if there's a way to kind of address, at least as a in a preliminary way, some of the concerns our IHS uh, workers and those who serve our community have raised, I'd love to see us be able to do that, um, and certainly. I uh, do think that, uh, you know, want to make sure we don't have like a cliff that we fall off for some of these homelessness services and mental health services so, and legal services, so potentially sort of putting some of that, that money uh, in for 25, 26 so we don't have a cliff. Um, so I can uh, summarize that again, but I think those are the big thoughts. I think just top line, I definitely want us to see us get to a sustaining fund. would love to see that be at least 75 million so like it's real money. Uh, second is I don't want to go below sort of like 20 across the board for those, um, the direct stimulus payment programs just based on sort of understanding that we want to do something real in those categories. Um, and I think putting some funding back in mental and behavioral health and homelessness makes sense and legal services. And fourth, just like, you know, looking kind of cross-sectionally, is there any way we can just begin to make a down payment on something around um, our HSS workers? So, not to be too concrete, but just I know there's a lot of thoughts to share, and I wanted to, to kick us off. Go, uh, Supervisor Desmond, and then Vice Chair Vargas. Uh, thank you, Chair. I appreciate the. Uh, this is pretty complicated, but I appreciate the staff uh, presentation on this, and I, I'm all in favor of creating a fund, <clears throat> you know, for uh, to leverage other other money. Hopefully, we can get it in the near future, but I, I think it's you know it's smart to put some of this away if if we can to capitalize on those dollars. However, I do see, you know, some very high priorities, you know, one, one of which is actually the foster care program within the uh, direct stimulus payments. I, you know, maybe cutting it in half, but, uh, you know, I, I think keeping 20 million in the direct stimulus fund, since we haven't even started most of those funds, is probably ambitious. You know, maybe 10 million or something like that, I think we might be a, a little bit more reasonable on that. But, but I, I do agree. I mean, how, how's homelessness and is one of our biggest problems here still. And I know we were slated to spend on that previous chart that was up, like 70 million in 22, 23, another 71 million in 24, 25, and then you know we had about 13 million left over. I'm just curious if we do front load some of the that more of that money for homelessness. Do we have programs to spend it? Do we have meaningful programs to spend it on? Because I just want to don't want to throw money at at something if we don't really have if it's if it's not going to do that much good. So, I, I, but I would, I, I do think, you know, addressing homelessness, maybe creating another uh, housing fund, you know, for that we can, uh, for uh, affordable housing developers that we, you know, maybe we help them with the first dollars to help them get some of those projects uh, off the ground. I, I know what, uh, that was successful in the past. And then, you know, the mental health and addiction. We still have, you know, mental health is tied right with homelessness. If we can make sure we have money towards mental health services. And I, you know, there again, I know we're doing phenomenal, and, and you're able to save a bunch of money here, uh, through Nick, and through uh, services uh, through uh, Alvarado Hospital. But you know, those those seem to be you know tied hand in hand, the homelessness and and uh, mental health. It, you know, that that's what we really got to get our arms around. And and I, I would like to see some of that direct stimulus dollars. 
some of the remaining balance and then some of it, maybe half the remaining balance going into a fund that, uh, you know, that we, that we use for the future. And one thing that's not on here and, hope, and I think it would go under mental health services is, is reducing jail deaths. You know, if there's something we can do with the Sheriff's Department to help reduce, reduce uh, jail deaths, I know we just, you know, came up with a new, um, and I know we got, we're talking about CLRB here pretty soon, but, um, uh, you know, the new scanner that, you know, our chair brought forward is a great idea. But, you know, this is kind of like, this is a nemesis. This is something we got to, you know, put more attention and, and time on. So those would be my priorities. You know, I, I think kind of the hybrid approach is good. Uh, probably taking most of the dollars out of the direct stimulus fund and then putting towards housing, homelessness, uh, and mental health, and then and then the jail issues. So thank you for my thank two you. cents. Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. Vice Chair Vargas. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, it's I think it's really important to emphasize, right, that ARPA funding was really created to make sure that during these really difficult times we were going to be prioritizing communities that were in, in greater need and included but not limited to food security, mental health care, youth, uh, non-cost transportation, et cetera. And so um, I really appreciate staff's update today and everything that they've shared and, and really think, really, the opportunity to really think thoroughly through this. But um, I'm really interested in continuing the ARPA investments in the direct stimulus category to provide the direct cash assistance for the populations that disproportionately were impacted by COVID-19. I think that has had a huge impact and that's a need. Um, I think that's what it was created for and I think that that's really important to continue to, that, to do that. So I wanna make sure that we uh, continue to do this and, and that staff really consider structuring the program as a one-time payment to assist immediate needs, right? So that uh, rather, rather than continuous payments, so that it can ensure that people who, who really need access to this program actually have that access um, really, you know, as soon as possible. I mean, and being very mindful that we need to look at other opportunities to support other programs as well. So that I think is one of the things that I want to make sure that we prioritize. I do support creating a, a fund. I think it's a really great idea. And it's interesting that uh, Supervisor Desmond talks about the housing component. I think one of the things that I um, am looking at as we're, we're doing, we're talking a lot about housing at, at different levels, right? Um, it's really how do we create um, home ownership opportunities and really build wealth for our communities because in America really the only way that if you don't have any access to resources, one of the only ways that you can ever, actually ever, um, you know, get to that space is by owning a home. And so thinking about how do we create opportunities so we can create home ownership opportunities first uh, for our employees as another different opportunity. Uh, uh, different thinking outside the box and really thinking about how do our employees um, who are the folks who are on the ground doing this work have opportunities to um, to home ownership and there's a couple of different programs throughout the country that I think maybe we're able to look into and um, and that would be money that would come back again so it's not just a one time but it's actually continuous and there's a couple of different ideas on that but we'd love to be able to text uh, talk to staff a little bit further about that um, and, and really thinking about reinvesting in the community that way. In addition to that, I think obviously um, I'm happy to support the, the foster um, care um, you know, program as well, because I think that as well, as we're thinking about the data that we've heard about our homeless population, right? We're talking about homeless population and our mental health, and what we have heard is there's a large population of our foster youth uh, that end up in a homeless situation, so I think it's, really addressing the issue uh, ahead of time before um, they actually find themselves in a uh, situation where they're on shelter. So um, happy to support the fund and interested in, in those other two programs and of course um, behavioral health and, and, um, and homelessness um, are a huge issue for me as well. And do you need a motion or? Uh, uh, I'll make a motion. We'll make... kind of get everyone's thoughts okay. and we'll throw most together. Supervisor okay. Anderson. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Uh, I uh, agree with my colleague uh, Nora, uh, you know, I, I look at this as an opportunity to, to have life-changing money. We know that we have homeless uh, issues that we're still facing. We have behavioral health. We made great progress in both. But, you know, I want to get people off the street. I don't want to push them down the street. And when I look at this and I think about how we're changing our behavioral health 
and for the first time, we're going to be drawing money down on the same types of beds that we were never able to draw down money because we've gone at it in a more thoughtful manner. That Evergreen Fund, I think, creates life-changing elements as the county moves forward over the next 50 years, potentially. And I'd just like to point out the California Local Housing Trust Fund that we have, that we use, we can't draw that money down because we don't have any more money to, to match. It's a one-to-one -one match. So when I look at what we could do with this money and the matches that we could chase that are available to us, that are going unused throughout the state, uh, makes no sense to me. I think having that access to increase housing, you know, the best thing we could do for homeless folks is to create more housing opportunities and avoid future homeless by creating the inventory necessary that allows our kids and, and everyone else to, to have a home if they wish to have a home. So, uh, you know, I, I like what my colleagues have said, but I'm really excited about the Evergreen opportunity and how we could double, triple, quadruple this money if spent wisely on programs that draw down money or have the money being recycled uh, with future payment in, in while filling the needs of our communities. All right, give me one sec here. Let me just do a little math. So, uh, you know, a couple things um, I've heard is a desire to trim but maintain uh, the, the kind of direct stimulus programs, uh, kind of breaking that between the innovations in foster care and disproportionately impacted communities, right? So I think, you know, that, that makes sense. I think ensuring that, that we maintain the full funding around mental health services and homeless services, uh, you know, making sure that we put those back in um, is one. Uh, we know we've got to address the issue with our IHSS workers uh, who have worked so hard for so long uh, and done so much and, uh, and, and really borne a tremendous burden on behalf of all of us. Um, and, you know, as was alluded, you know, some of that will be done as we head into our contract to get you a sustainable contract and effort, you know, as we move forward and do that right. But perhaps there's some, some opportunities here where we could do that. And then also reserve the bulk of the, of, of the reserve to put into these renewable funds. Again, these are funds that could last decades upon decades and pay it back and continue to serve. And so as we think about how we would, we would kind of divvy um, these up, um, I'll just throw out a, a concept in the, in the form of a, of a motion to get us kind of started. If we put 7.5 into the foster care program, that would get you around your 400 families being better than 200. Uh, if we did 10 into those disproportionately impacted um, that would do that, that would be 17.5. And then maybe we want to have a little bit of creativity uh, with, a, with a small amount of assistance um, around seeing what we might help do for some of our, our home workers or child care workers or something in that space in this same vein of what we're doing for disproportionately impacted. And there need to be some flexibility. We'd have to work on that for a little bit. But if we put that, say, roughly 1.5, then we put back the 7.5 for mental health, the 13.4 for homelessness, um, that would, and Ebony and Helen can check me on this as I do this. That would be 39.9. And then if we added 100,000 for legal services, that would take us to an even 40 million. Which would, yeah, I will, I will. But then that would leave 79 that we could uh, work on for Evergreen. So let me walk through that again. If we did 7.5 for foster care innovations, 10 for disproportionately impacted, 1.5 for staff to work and bring back some ideas or things around our child care workers, IHSS workers, something along those lines, 7.5 for mental health, 13.4 for homelessness, 100K for legal services, I believe that would take us to 40 million exact. We take that minus the 119, which would leave 79 million in reserves. What I would, would suggest out of the, yeah. Yeah, 100,000 would take us to 40. 
So, I mean, we, we could do more. I'm just throwing it out there to, to get a discussion moving. Yeah, yeah, that would, that would bring us, right. So then we would have 79 um, left. You know, what would be interesting on this, on the behavioral health workforce, there's kind of a ready to go effort around this. San Diego Workforce Partnership has the program, they're ready to launch, they're ready to help, um, you know, workers immediately um, do that, and, and it, would, it wouldn't take very long to do that. If we were to do, I'm just doing the math here. Say we did 29 million for behavioral health workforce, that would leave 50 that we could come back and work on housing ideas. And I think the housing ideas could either be the new home buyer program, or it could be some construction or something else. Um, and it, we, we would need to spend some time working on that. We don't have one of those ready to go. We have some concepts and some ideas. Um, so if we did that, then we could, we could move forward with the 29 in the Behavioral Health Workforce Program. That's pretty ready to go with the Workforce par Partnership. And then direct staff, and we could have the subcommittee work and bring the board back a series of ideas on the 50 that we could create these renewable funds around housing um, that would, would uh, renew themselves. It's gonna take a little bit of time to do some work on that and come back. Um, so let me restate all that, and then we can, we'll get a second, and then we can, we're up for discussion, and we can do. So it would basically be, 7.5 foster care, 10 for the disproportionate direct payments, which would be cutting those in half, 1.5 to work on some ideas around assistance for home health care, child care workers, 7.5 back to mental health, 13.4 to homelessness, 100,000 to legal services. That would leave us 79 million in reserve. If we did 29 of that for a behavioral health renewable evergreen fund, that would leave 50 out of that 50, we can work and develop some ideas for the board to consider around renewable evergreen homeless programs. Does that math add up? That's correct. So okay. you got 79 yeah. as, as evergreen, 29 of that for behavioral health, and then yeah. 50 for housing. Okay. For housing. Something around housing. Now, the housing is not yet flushed out. We'd have to go work to come back with the board on you know, what those programs would look like. Could some of that 29 in behavioral health go towards, uh, I mean, the jails are behavioral health, and, and some of that could possibly go. Absolutely. Go I mean, a lot of the need to recruit and retain that yeah, workforce. Yeah, I, I don't know what, but I think I, if that could be right allowed under the behavioral health. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and absolutely, and we could figure out how we okay. tailor that to help. I don't know what the program exactly, workers. but I want to okay. have, have some of that uh, designated. Okay. Supervisor Weston, remember? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I think we're definitely heading in the, in the same direction very much. I think there's a couple things I'm not completely on board with on that proposal, but uh, mm -hmm. roughly very much in the same direction. I think you're sort of outlining of um, all the pieces of, of sort of how you get to 79 left in the sustaining fund. I think all of that made sense to me. Okay. Um, I think my um, <clears throat> modification to your proposals, I don't feel quite ready right now to sign off on exactly 29 million to like the workforce partnership program or exactly 50 to, to um, a kind of an unknown housing. I'd rather us have 79 we know with direction to come back with some proposals on housing and on behavioral health with the workforce partnership uh, proposal as like a jumping off point. Um, but I think it, I just think it needs a little bit more uh, bottoming out, whether it's 15 or 40 in workforce partnership, whether it's 50 or 60 in housing. I'm just not quite ready to make, um, to uh, divide the bucket like that, but I would be quite comfortable with supporting 79 for sustaining fund, focused on mental and behavioral health and housing with some proposals to come back for the board with a uh, direction that the first thing to look at will be that workforce partnerships uh, fund. Yeah, we, we can do that. We're really significantly delaying the launch of the Behavioral Health Workforce Program if we do that. I mean, you were yeah. a part of that launch. The program's up and running, ready to go. If we tie one that's ready to go to ones that haven't even been conceptually thought out or beginning phases put together, we're six, nine months or longer delaying doing that. So we, 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 can, we can do that. I mean, we can do whatever as a board we decide. Um, you know, I'm just like, it took a year to develop that program. Um, and the other ones, we have some vague concepts in our head, but nothing that is even remotely close to being put on the street. So if we tie those mm -hmm. two together, we're really mm -hmm. tying our hands about addressing the biggest need we have 
in our homeless shelters, in our jails, in our health care settings. I, no, I hear you. I think that's, there's a good argument there. I still feel like uh, when I look at that workforce partnership report, I thought it was great, but I also thought there were some like really important investments in how we build out our uh, work for our minimum behavioral health workforce that uh, weren't really clearly fleshed out at all, or at least not in a way I felt comfortable with yeah. in the in that recommendation. Um, and I certainly wouldn't feel comfortable uh, taking all of our 29 million on mental and behavioral health workforce development yeah. and putting it only in that program because I think that we there are some other options. So maybe there's a a compromise here where we carve off say 10 to just jumpstart that you program. Can't start it's with 10. Yeah, that, it, it's not financially sustainable. But, at 10. but let's go to Vice Chair Vargas. Yeah. So I have a question. We've invested all this money on the behavioral health piece already, and we know that the number that we need is 29 million, right? No, I just no, did that. Just kind of took it out I just the, split it so it'd be yeah. even numbers. It's, okay. it's not. Do we know how much we're going to lose? Well, yeah. I mean, the workforce report came out. I mean, it's 400 million. Four, yeah, upwards years. above. It was like 480. Um, or you something. know, 128 kind yeah. of ready to go. They can get the initial fund up uh, and, and operating for, you know, 15 ish, right around there. Um, and and it, we're not even, I mean, we're working with the state, a bunch of other partners yeah. to get and additional funding. Yeah, and we're trying to get additional resources yeah. and funding from it's other just, places. It's just a question of what, what you can get launched quick. It just seems to me that, so the ARPA funding was created so that we can meet the, the need right now, right? And I think the big challenge with the workforce piece, and the reason why I'm supporting the amount um, is because we need to get this started now. We haven't actually seen what the impact of COVID is going to be in our communities just yet. So by the time we get the workforce ready to go, uh, based on the need, culturally appropriate, you know, all of that, I think it's gonna take a while. And so it seems to me that it's prudent to be able to put these resources in them now. And then we have this other pot of money, which is the other 50 million that we're gonna be looking at to figure out where else could we spend these dollars. And we're gonna get matching, hopefully the, the whole purpose is that we get additional matching mm -hmm. funds and stuff. So. I understand some of the challenges that you're talking about. Like, I don't think that it goes, does it all go to the workforce partnership? No, it's, or it's the fund. It's, it's, it's a, the it's funding fund that yeah. gets created and then yeah. and having but been the on structure the, of the fund yeah. precludes some of the specific ideas I'm most interested in how we would structure. So, so what, it, what if we I did mean, this, Tara? Like, like what, what if we it. took a part of this to kind of launch and then some of it we could kick over into the 50 that would come back with housing and behavioral health. That ideas. would be great. I mean, I definitely, uh, he, I am strongly in support of that uh, yeah. workforce partnership. And I would yeah, like, yeah, if, yeah, I like if we think 15 is enough to get it moving, I'd support that as well. I just want us to have some flexibility in the ideas that come back to the board on mental and behavioral health and housing uh, without slowing down that workforce partnership. So, so to revise my motion, if we drop the, the 29 to 15, then that would leave us 64, and then the goal would be to have staff and subcommittee work on ideas with the 64 that tackle both housing and behavioral health workforce. I, I would absolutely be comfortable with that. And again, I think, what I think it's a let me, let me Let me walk, let me walk, walk, walk back through what subcommittee? the change, the little fiscal subcommittee who, who worked on this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, we worked a lot on this. So then the change would be instead of 29 straight into behavioral health workforce, we would do 15. You would take the 14 left, add it to the 50, so that would be 64, and 64 is what we would then bring the board back options on, and those options could be housing or behavioral health related for evergreen renewable funds, and then we could decide at a future date how to how to split those up. I, so, I have a quick question yep. for you. So on the workforce, that's a renewable. That's correct? exactly right. It's the program that you d discussed. Yep. I'm not opposed to uh, when they come back with the 64. Put some more back in. To take another Agreed. bite at that apple. Yep. I don't want to rule out not Got doing the full 29. Got it. But I get we need to jumpstart what we can jumpstart. Yeah. Thank Perfect. you. And I, I would like a, um, I'm not all that familiar with this behavioral health workforce uh, program. So I guess I need some more, I need to be brought up to speed on that. So it's, okay. I, I like the fact, okay, to bring it down to 15 and then we come back and work on and, the rest. And get a little, little bit more familiar. I'm, I'm not as familiar with it as the rest of you are, but the Understood. behavioral work. And, I, and quite frankly, one thing that's kind of going through my head is the unincorporated area, we, we have to make sure that, you know, we're, we're taking care of them as well. And, and uh, I, I, I want to make sure that that's a factor as well. Understood. In here. Thank yep. you. Okay, so motion 7.5 foster care, 10 disproportionate, 1.5 uh, assistance, 7.5 mental health, 13.4 homeless, 100,000 legal services, 15 behavioral health, 
renewable fund in partnership with workforce partnership. 64 remains in reserve to be dealt with by the board through consideration of multiple programs around housing and behavioral health, and we will get back as quickly as we can with those items. Um, we have a motion and a second. Let's I have a make, question. Yeah, make sure everyone the the legal services that we're putting into it, what that's does that cover? That's the continuation of the existing ones that we've been doing. Okay. It's nothing new. Uh, I don't believe I voted for it the first time. No? Okay. And we I'd like buy to bifurcate. Yes, yes, please. That's fine. Absolutely. Check. All right. Supervisor Lawson, Uh I just want to thank um, staff, honestly, for all of your work. I, I know how uh, complex this has been. Uh, we have so many needs in our community um, and trying to figure out how we meet the best, meet those the best we can, uh, both now and in the future. Um, you know, and I think you guys have just done a really, really, really tremendous job. So thank you to the team for all of that. And I also really want to thank my colleagues. Um, I think there's a lot of thought in this conversation and really appreciate um, you know, the, the alignment on these shared goals and us being able to, to move something forward that both invests today and as, you know, I think as my colleague, uh, Vice Chair Vargas always points out, sort of like the urgent needs that people face in our community um, while also really being mindful of how do we create something that can be sustaining and self-generating for the future. So I think uh, I, re I strongly support um, your, your motion, Chair Fletcher. I think it's a great direction and I, I think this is a really tremendous um, way forward. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So we got a motion. It's uh, recommendations one, two B, and three with the funding that's outlined. Please vote. This is uh, everything minus legal services. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. And now please vote for legal services. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes with Supervisor Anderson voting no, all other supervisors being present and voting aye. All right, thank you all. Um, let's go to uh, agenda item number 21, Citizens Law Enforcement Review Board Annual Report. Uh, we will uh, welcome Paul and team to uh, get settled. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Fletcher, Vice Chair Vargas, and members of the board. Thank you for this opportunity for me to present the CLRB 2021 Annual Report and 2022 Semi-Annual Report. Next slide, please. Just to refresh so everyone knows exactly what it is we do, we were created 30-some years ago. Our primary focus at the time was to receive and investigate complaints of misconduct, but also to look at deaths that occurred arising out of the actions of or connected to the actions of sworn members only of the sheriffs and probation departments. So over the years, we haven't, honestly, we didn't do that very well. Uh, but for reasons that we'll talk about uh, coming up, that is our, my primary focus as the executive officer. In, about two years ago, this board allowed us to investigate uses of force and discharges of firearms without signed complaints. That's been very, very helpful to open, after the murder of George Floyd, to open the conversation about uses of force. Uh, obviously, I'm here to present our annual report, but one of the things I think that we do very well and that has been overlooked for years is our ability to make recommendations about policies and procedures of the sheriff and probation department. So what I've done based on the death and custody issue that this county is facing, I wanted to take our annual report and semi-annual report and, and so, uh, primarily focus it on deaths and custody, deaths related to the actions of law enforcement, and the recommendations we've made and whether or not they've been accepted or not. Next slide, please. Next. So real quickly, a real quick overview. As you can see, last year we had 130 new cases. That includes deaths, and, and we'll break all this down here in a little bit. It was a 12% increase from 2020. We think our numbers were down in 2020 because of COVID. We think, uh, you know, we'll just leave it at that. That's what we believe, and, and we'll talk about our 2022 numbers here in about five minutes. Next, please. So typically, this is the breakdown of those new cases from 2021. There are four different bureaus or, or entities that we look at. The Sheriff's Department Detention Facilities, the Sheriff's Department Law Enforcement Services, the Probation Department, 
in the Sheriff's Court Services Bureau. This, what you're seeing right here for 2021, is very, very typical. For years now, it's usually very close to 50 percent, you know, maybe 48, 48 uh, for law enforcement and detention. Uh, probations anywhere from 3 to 5 percent every year. Court services, very low. Now, you're going to see in 2022, so far this year, there's a big difference here. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. Next, please. So let's talk about deaths. I, I did focus solely on these reports for death and our policy recommendations. So as we all know, just real quickly, a couple of years ago, the Union Tribune did a study about folks dying in custody that ultimately led to the Joint Legislative Audit Committee doing an audit, which ultimately then right before that, CLRB, I mean, we are the independent oversight entity. Let's actually do that. We commissioned an independent report uh, as well. So the Joint Legislative Audit Committee, as we all know, we've heard this, made several recommendations to the Sheriff's Department. A lot of it dealt with the type of safety checks that were being done, the, the issues around intake screening for medical and mental health care. And as what we had done already were made policy recommendations over the last couple of years pertaining to those topics. We've done that again over the last year and a half, which we'll discuss. Our independent finding indicated as a refresher that San Diego County residents themselves are no more likely to die than any other resident of any other county in this, in this state. However, the San Diego County jails, the, 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 ten, the, the detention facilities run by the Sheriff's Department had the highest rate of unexplained or unexpected, not unexplained because the causes and manners were determined, which we'll discuss, but unexpected deaths. The other thing that came out was that white folks were more likely to die in custody, whereas black folks were more likely to be in custody. And then the rate of accidental overdose was highest in San Diego County as compared to 13 other similarly sized uh, counties or throughout, the, throughout the state. So all counties that were assessed had high suicide rates. But I want to point out that the Sheriff's Department, a couple of years ago, that was an issue. Suicides in custody was a main issue. We'll get some, some details now. We know that that's not a primary focus right now. The primary focus, as this board has discussed, is the accidental overdoses, specifically re, uh, related to fentanyl. So what have we tried to do? Well, one of the things that also needs to be pointed out is there's an elevated risk of deaths for folks in the county jail who are not sentenced at all. We don't believe that they're even convicted. Any one of us here tonight could wind up, I contend, could wind up in a county jail for something maybe they didn't do. So that's concerning to us, and that's what we want to look at when we make these recommendations. So next, please. So let's talk about those deaths and why we're focusing on them. So in 2021, all deaths that we looked at were 25. Now, to be clear, 18 of those stemmed from the Detention Services Bureau, and we'll break those down in the next slide. But for right now, six were related to patrol, uh, to law enforcement patrol activities or possibly related. So out of those six, three deaths that we looked at were folks who had barricaded themselves in custody, uh, in a house or in a car, and ultimately when the house was surrounded by law enforcement, whether they were, uh, you know, there were negotiation that was able to be attempted or not, these folks unfortunately took their own lives. We look at those as well. There was one traffic fatality stemming from a vehicle pursuit. I'll talk about more, I'll talk about that specific situation later when we talk about our policy recommendations. There was one drug-related death that occurred uh, in the patrol services division where someone was arrested and subsequently died, uh, you know, out in the patrol. They didn't get it to the jail. And then there was one deputy-involved shooting. Probation department had one 16-year-old uh, person who died at the Kearney Mesa Juvenile Detention Facility. I don't yet know what the, the manner of death is on that, and we'll, we'll discuss that later. Next slide, please. So out of the 18 jail deaths that occurred in 2021, Nine of them, it's, it's usually this way. This is usually the number breakdown is 50% occur at Central Jail. And then you can see the breakdown for Vista and George Bailey. Those are usually two and three, three, you know, back and forth. One, one, one sec, Paul. I think we're one slide off. Can you, let's back up one slide. There we go. Okay. Hey, there we are. Perfect. All right. My apologies for that. But uh, so anyway, that's where we are. So let's, let's re-talk about that. So 50% of the of the deaths that occur in the detention facility in 2021, and you'll, you'll see it's in 2022 as well, occur at San Diego Central Jail. And then we talk about Vista Detention and George Bailey, uh, kind of usually two and three when it comes to jail deaths. I do want to make clear, because I, I want to I ensure that this board is, is understands. You may have heard in the past that the Sheriff's Department 
uh, when someone dies in a hospital, let's say that they're in county jail, they become ill or injured, and they're transported to a hospital, and they subsequently die. You've heard that the Sheriff's Department uh, reports those deaths to the state, but that not many other entities do. And this is inaccurate. Out of the 2,100 deaths that occurred in a county jail facility between 2005 and 2020, out of 2,100, 51 percent of those deaths throughout the state, in the 14 counties that we looked at, 51 percent of those deaths occurred in a hospital. They were reported by the other entities. To the Sheriff's Department credit, what they are reporting, and they're not legally required to report, are those folks who are compassionately released. If someone becomes ill or injured in custody, and they're compassionate, they, they go to a hospital, and it looks as if they're not, go, you know, they're in very bad shape, they're going to die. The department goes to the court, and they are, a judge's order compassionately releases them. The department does not have to note them anywhere as an in-custody death. But to their credit, they do that. I want to make that very clear, that when this says jail death, it does not mean they're dying, all of them, in the jail. Some of them are dying in the hospital. Next slide, please. So to the ethnicity, as we kind of touched on before, 50 percent of the folks who died in 2021 were white. Latinx were 44 percent. And then, as you can see, black is 6 percent and other is zero at that time. Now, I, we put, the, as far as the county population, these are fairly similar to the county's population, these numbers that we have here. 50 percent white, county population is 47 percent. 44 percent Latinx, 33 percent. So that's higher. It's one-third higher than the county population. Black, 6%. County population, 5%. So that's the ethnicity of the folks that died in 2021. Next slide, please. So the manners of death. We hear manners all the time. Oh, let me, I don't want to overstep the uh, Dr. Campman and his folks, but manners of death, there are five, and I think they need to be made very clear what they are because there's some confusion and some things that are thrown out about neglect and whatnot. So a homicide, and these are all, these matters are determined by the medical examiner's office. A homicide is the death, the intentional death of a, at the hands of another person. Suicide is, is when someone intention, has their intention to end their own life. An accidental death is an unintentional result of, a, of an action. And then you have natural deaths. Now we hear all the time that the natural deaths that are happening in custody, as you can see, 45% of the deaths that occurred in 2021 were natural. So what's that mean? It means that they were due to the result of a disease or illness only. Nothing else contributed to the death from a medical examiner perspective. But the concern is that there is neglect and that the medical care is not appropriate, therefore contributing to the natural deaths. Well, as you know, CLRB does not have jurisdiction over medical or mental health care providers in the, in the county jails. And that's something that I'm continuing to push for, working very closely with county council uh, to make that happen, to bring that before this board. If the medical examiner's office determined there was some kind of neglect, like really egregious, I'm sure that they would classify the death as a homicide. Uh, but th that's where we stand. So I wanted to break that down. So as you can see, natural deaths, 45 percent. You can read the slide. But let's talk about the types of each. So for the homicides, there was a blunt force trauma, and then someone was, was uh, uh, basically strangled in custody. So those were the two homicides. And I'm sorry to talk about these things in public, but it is what it is at this point. I want to make sure everybody knows what's, what these deaths are. As far as the suicides that happened in 2021, they are reduced from many years ago. One suicidal death was related to hanging. But to show you how if someone wants to die, the other suicide death was acute water intoxication. They drank water as much as they could for the purpose of ending their own life. Out of the deaths, out of the eight natural deaths, five were COVID-related. Out of the six uh, drug-related deaths, uh, four were fentanyl, one was methamphetamine, and one was a combination of fentanyl and methamphetamine. Now, that's in 2021. In 2020, the six drug-related deaths were all fentanyl. And in 2019, if I recall, the five drug-related deaths were all methamphetamine. So you see the trend, just like this county is fighting, that is also the trend in custody. We've already talked about the other type of deaths. Next slide, please. Just overview of our general findings, and then we'll get back into this. 
overview of our general findings, out of the 527 allegations that, of misconduct or something that had gone wrong, out of those 527, almost 50 percent we deemed to be, yes, that, that activity occurred, however, it was justified. Body-worn camera has really helped us to make our determinations, and we applaud the department for rolling that out, and we also applaud the department for we believe its goal is to implement body-worn camera in the detention facilities, because right now the videos that we get, they're not very good. They don't have sound. You can see, kind of, but it'd be great to have body-worn camera. We, we applaud the department for taking those steps to move forward with that. Not sustained, so two, two out of ten uh, basically indicate that you know, uh, I'm sorry, five out of, uh, one fifth of them, uh, we couldn't tell. Did something wrong happen? Did something bad happen or not? We can't tell. We didn't have enough evidence. Unfounded, it, it means it, it didn't happen. And sustained means it did happen and it was wrong. Now, next slide, please. Actually, let me, you know what? Can we go back for a second? I apologize. These summary dismissal, I want to, this is very important. So summary dismissal, 17% of our cases we dismiss, somebody signs a complaint and says something happened here, we think it was wrong, but we don't have jurisdiction over it. And out of the 87 summarily dismissed cases, almost 20% of those were allegations against medical staff. We can't even look at them. Can't even look at them. 40%. We had to summarily dismiss 40% of those 87 because our own rules and regulations hamstring us. If somebody makes a complaint about egregious conduct to the sheriff's or probation department, and it happened two years ago or three years ago, they can look at it. We cannot. Our own rules and regulations drafted 30 years ago say, nah, sorry, you have a year. That's it. So a year and a day, there's nothing we can do. We have to work with county council. I am working with county council to make that change. We have to come in line with what the department itself can do. So that's. That, that's really all I have to say about that. So let's go to our closed cases, please. Next slide. Out of the 121, you can see we fully investigated 75. Procedurally closed means that these folks contacted us and said something's wrong, but they did not sign a signed complaint, uh, a complaint signed under penalty of perjury. These numbers, this number used to be 45%, but our staff, we are going out, we are going to the jails, we are meeting these people where they are with hopes that they'll sign that complaint so that we can at least look into the, the situation. So one of the things that's been brought up at, at least uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, not under the current sheriff's administration, but previously was, you know, the department has a lot of, uh, the department's rates of in custody deaths are higher because there's no local detention, there's no local booking facility. Other counties, they book into local detention or, or you know, local facilities, municipal jails, and, and the deaths happen there. But see, we as the county jail, the, the thought was, they get booked straight into the county facilities. And so that's why our deaths are higher. So we want to look at that. So the deaths that we, that we closed, we closed 14 death cases in 2021. Now, they were from 2020, some of them were for 2021, 2019. It took us a while to get these cases done because we didn't have the materials. Out of those 14, 35% of those folks died between zero and six days. 35%, zero and six days of being in the Sheriff's Department custody. 65% died seven or more days. Three of them dying well over 100 days after being in custody. So we want to make sure that that's clear. So let's go to the next slide where we talk about the recommendations. In 2021, we made 12 recommendations. Our goal is to make 12. Since I've been back as the executive officer, I'm, I've got to be honest, and the Sheriff's Department and Probation Department know this, I'm going to make as many as possible. Because I believe, and they don't have to respond to us. The departments don't have to. But they do. They do respond to us in public. And they tell us, okay, we did it or we didn't. So let's talk about the, the, the 12 that we made. Half were accepted, and we'll get into these numbers. How about we just go to the next slide and we'll get into the numbers. Because that's, to me, are in the top three things that we're looking at right now. We'll get into some of the others here in a minute. I want to make sure that our recommendations are pertaining to deaths in custody. So we made 12. Six were implemented. And these are, these are very good. These are great. And we're very, very happy that the department did that. The uh, sanitary food service, plant cell, you know, we, we can, we'll talk about that at a later time. De-escalation. 
We noted that their policy said that, that the deputies may use de-escalation tactics. We recommended that it be shall, and they implemented that. Clear response to death investigations this is a huge. This is something that I was told years ago would never happen. But the Sheriff's Department and myself, we entered into an MOU, and I thus, uh, to allow me to respond to any death scene. And since I signed it on February 14th, I've been to upwards of 16, uh, to include in custody deaths and also deputy involved shootings and whatnot. The department has been very transparent at these scenes. My whole point of being there is to see from an independent perspective. And they have worked with me very well and provided me and answered any questions I've had. Discontinuing sealing of in custody death cases. The, the Sheriff's Department, as a matter of routine, prior to this implementation, uh, would seal medical examiner reports on any in custody death. So family couldn't get information, community, media, nobody could get information. Uh, they now are no longer doing that, and, and they deserve kudos for doing that. Uh, next slide, please. One's not accepted. Now, two of these are, are basically just clarify some verbiage. We're not going to talk about those. Safety checks during the booking process. Um, they should be checked. You know, folks sometimes could be in booking for many hours, and, and we didn't think some of the checks were being done in a timely fashion. The department at this time said that they're being done uh, in a fashion that they should be, and they didn't implement our, our uh, recommendation. The cells, uh, we recommended don't use cells in the booking process that, don't, that have inoperable cameras. And they said, sometimes we have to, obviously, because there are no other cells available. That led to a conversation about working with, uh, you know, having Department of General Services come to one of our meetings to talk about the cameras. So we've done that. Next slide, please. One's still pending a response. One's from probation. We made the exact same recommendation to the probation department about our death scene responses. And then the other one is not to, to interview incarcerated persons in front of other incarcerated persons about an incident that occurred in in custody because other folks are looking at this interview and thinking that that incarcerated person is providing information against them or whatnot when in fact maybe they're not. We're waiting for a response on that for the safety of those incarcerated persons. Next slide please. So that's 2021 and, and perhaps I can just move forward to 2022 and we can do any questions or concerns afterwards. So thus far, and I know it's a semi-annual, but I, I felt the need to you know bring this, make this as up to date as possible quite frankly. Next slide. So. We're on pace for 155 new cases this year uh, as of August 20th. And next slide, please. And out of the new cases, you can see a huge shift to 60% just about of these new cases are coming from the detention facilities, only 27 from law enforcement. There's a big shift with uh, court services, too, 10%. Uh, so normally, that's 1%. And right now, this is, I get it, it's only through August, and we'll see what the end of the year uh, results are. Probation's 4%. Next slide, please. So I'm going to break it down again for the deaths. 22 total deaths thus far, 16 of those in custody. San Diego uh, Sheriff's Department Law Enforcement Services, there are four. One was a deputy-involved shooting. One was that barricade type of situation we've discussed before. And two were due to unknown causes or manners. And then through the, the courts have two. One is a deputy-involved shooting, and one is uh, they went to evict someone, and that person, uh, either right before they got there or after, set their house on fire and subsequently died, uh, was found dead inside. So we're looking at that. Next slide, please. So the deaths, again, 50%. Of the 16 Detention Services Bureau deaths, to be clear from the first death, there were no deaths until February 10th of this year, uh, February 10th. And the most recent one was about a week and a half ago, almost two weeks ago now at, at, uh, at George Bailey. So half of those are at Central, and then you see the breakdown with, with the others. Let's talk about exactly what we've done before, the ethnicity. Next slide, please. Very similar to what, to what we found uh, last year. Very similar. So we're, we don't really need to discuss any more. It's a very, it seems to be a consistent breakdown. Next slide, please, for manners. So the manners of death again. Now, here's the issue. I don't have any information for you. Out of the 16 in custody deaths right now, I can tell you that three were natural, and one of them was COVID-related. But the other 13, I don't have information. Uh, whether that's because the medical examiner's office, uh, due to the backlog and the, and the fentanyl and the overdoses and whatnot, we're waiting for additional testing for many of these deaths. So hopefully, by the end of the year, I can give you some more information about the manners of death occurring this year. Next slide, please. 
Again, these findings for our overall, our overall findings, very almost similar to last year. We're a little uptick in our number of cases or allegations that we have sustained findings against law enforcement. But back to what we discussed before, the summary dismissed cases. 10% of the 81, a little over 10% of the 81 that we've summarily dismissed were against medical staff. Can't look into them, have no clue. Rules and regulations, our own rules and regulations hamstring us in 28% of these summarily dismissed cases. Next slide, please. Closed cases again, very similar to what we talked about in 2021. The time between booking and incident giving rise to the death or being found dead, uh, zero to six days, 18%. Seven days to over 182 uh, percent. Just for note, in the San Diego County Detention Facility custody, 101 plus days, 56 percent, nine of the 16. So they're in custody for a long time now. Next slide, please. The recommendations. Again, I'm going to keep making them. We've done 26 this year. We're only two thirds of the way through the year. Next slide. Out of the ones that were accepted, so eight of the 26 thus far have been accepted. The first two, to research technological devices to monitor the health and safety of incarcerated persons and to incorporate those device uses to identify those in medical distress. The department accepted that, those recommendations, that they would look at technological devices. Just so this board knows what we put in that. There are wristbands that other entities are using very similar to Fitbit type devices. So why would we not be using that? Why not look at doing something along those lines to monitor the vital signs of folks in custody? I believe the department is, is, is taking this seriously and I hope that they implement something along those lines. We also recommended and the department implemented making Narcan available to the incarcerated population and to educate the incarcerated population on opioid overdose and whatnot. We believe that one life has been saved thus far by incarcerated persons using the naloxone on another incarcerated person. And then we've also recommended to strengthen the family liaison protocol, and they implemented it. The problem was what the issue was, at least what families were saying, and the department says that's not true, but what families were telling us was when someone died in custody, they weren't told really what was going on throughout the whole course of the investigation, and even at the end, According to these families we've talked to, they were not being told, for the most part. The department uh, revised and strengthened their policy to make sure that that happens. So that is one great recommendation that they've implemented. The last one, we asked the department, and, they, and I put it down here as an implemented recommendation. We asked the department to mandate that fentanyl-trained drug-sniffing dogs are used to sniff persons, any person entering or present in a detention facility to include staff. We asked that it be will. The department responded and implemented it, but made it may. So the dogs may be used. So I'm saying it's implemented because they addressed the staff issue. But at this point it says may. And we can talk a little bit more about that in another recommendation that we've made. So we consider the department has implemented it and it's up to them, you know, we, we may go back to the department and I think we should go back to the department and, and ask, uh, okay, when did you do it, right? And see if they've actually done it, even though it's a May, right? Uh, further, uh, next, next slide, please. So they've implemented uh, recommendations about uh, pre-employment screening for bias. We, everybody we've talked about, uh, implicit and explicit bias, they have been doing for 25 years what the state law just changed to make mandatory that psychological evaluations include this pre-employment screening for bias. The department tells me they've been doing it for those years, which is great to hear. So they've implemented that. And then we've also asked at the department uh, that deputies shall begin their BW, the body worn camera recording prior to any law enforcement related contact. They implemented that. That was any law enforcement related contact at a scene. And that comes into play here in a minute. Next slide, please. The recommendations that were not accepted. Every recommendation on here. Uh, let me give a little background. A couple years ago, Campaign Zero did, a, uh, did an analysis of the Sheriff's Department's practices. Campaign Zero indicated that they found or they believed that there was a pattern of racially disparate treatment. 
the Sheriff's Department commissioned its own study for the Center for Policing Equity. And that, the CPE report came back and said, we believe this department is engaged in racially disparate practices. The department disagrees with the findings in the, and the data and the methodology on, the, on those reports. But based on those reports, we generated, we created a subcommittee and we made the following recommendations. None of these recommendations were accepted and there were reasons provided. But the recommendations, they're bold, they're outside the box. Um, some people you know, would say they're just not doable, but we contended that to, to try to attempt, in an attempt to reduce racially disparate practices, perhaps you eliminate stopping or contacting people solely for lower level offenses. Statistics tend, and you can make whatever you want out of the statistics, I get that. But there's a, there's a belief that lower level offenses, uh, people being contacted for those lower level offenses are primarily persons of color. And so we contended that people of, of color are being contacted purely for protectual reasons, right? In an attempt to find something and use these lower level offenses. I mean, there are occasions if you drive in other entities, they have red light cameras, they never stop you. They don't stop you. They send you a ticket to the registered owner. Why not do something very similar? Uh, so that, because where do the uses of force, where does the, the, the deaths in custody happen with the contact? So we were trying to still have folks enforce the law, but maybe somehow reduce the contact. They, and the department did not agree. Quality of life issues not jeopardizing public safety. We, we asked that they eliminate that. Um, and, and again, the department, to its credit, said, look, if you, you want us to do all these things, you're actually making us discriminate in the process. You're making us not follow the law in the process. We asked that they um, look at their use of discretion policy to at least consider, have a deputy consider. I mean, I was a police officer many, many years ago. And if I would have been told, or at least it would, I, I would have been, okay, with every stop I make, or whatever I'm doing, is that, is that really racially disparate? Am I doing it, is it gonna result in something that's not, that, yeah. and they said, no, uh, for the reasons we just talked about, that again, that would be discrimination in and of itself. I contend that if uh, body-worn camera footage is reviewed to see how white people are treated as opposed to people of color, um, I think that'd be a very good idea. Uh, but the department says that they look at the body-worn camera footage already uh, to look for patterns, and so they did not accept that. And then, uh, again, we, we talked about, uh, I, went, I went to the, to the people of color versus the uh, white folks, but then to provide a justification for a stop or contact on body-worn camera. And the department does that already. It's just there's a 30-second delay built in when they hit the button to begin capturing it, that the voice is not there. So they said no to that. Next slide, please. In addition, as I said, we're going to continue to make recommendations about any death that occurs. So there was a pursuit a year and a half ago uh, for a stolen vehicle. And unfortunately, that stolen vehicle uh, entered a, uh, an intersection against a red light and a completely uninvolved person was uh, struck while driving her vehicle and died. So I contend, um, again, I was a police officer and I, and I look back on what I did back in the day and uh, you know, I look at it now. Why are we chasing vehicles for property crimes? Now, that's my point, right? That's what I would think. But I understand that many, many times it's not just a property crime. It's not just a stolen vehicle. It's not just someone com committing a, an infraction for running a red light and then they bolt on you. And that ultimately other things are found at the stop, in this case specifically, right? A gun was found, I believe. Uh, I get it. but. I also think that, you know, if it's a property crime initially, maybe it's something we could look at doing differently. And, I, and to the department's credit, once an air unit gets overhead, they call it off, they back off. That needs to be noted, that they are doing that. I'm saying don't even start. So uh, those are the recommendations that were not accepted. Now, the one recommendation that was not accepted was the requiring of body scans of folks transferring between facilities. We contend and we'll talk more about these body scans in a minute. We contend 
that somehow, and the department itself has made presentations here and to us saying that drugs are getting in from the incarcerated persons and the mail. That's the two top ways they're getting in. Folks are body scanned upon being booked. But it's our understanding that if they go to court uh, or they transfer to another facility that perhaps they're not body scanned. But the department, they, we had a great discussion about this and, and they were, I think they'd like to do it, but they contend it would, it would create a, uh, operational delays, a uh, backup. And we'll talk more about that here with our next one. Next slide, please. Here are the ones, uh, recommendations that we made that are pending a response. We'll talk about the main ones here. The department contends, again, mail and the incarcerated persons themselves are bringing the drugs into the facility. Okay, we recommend it to digitally scan all of the mail, non-legal mail coming in, and either electronically have the incarcerated person view it or print it out on county issued or county controlled paper or something so that those substances that, may, that, the, that the stuff may be dipped in or present or whatever are not introduced into the facility. So we're waiting for that response to that. The main one that we made, and, and to Supervisor Anderson's credit, you know, he brought the question up a couple of weeks ago. Hey, you know, if, if pilots have to go through uh, scanners and TSA folks, well, why not staff? And that's something we've been kicking around for quite a while. But we made the recommendation last week. We, the recommendation was to physically search or scan all persons entering detention facilities to include, em, to include employees and contractors. Unfortunately, in the press, the department has already shot that down. And so they say that there's no data. I contend there's no data because you haven't looked for it perhaps. I don't know. So that's where we are with that. And otherwise, next slide. Those are the additional ones pending response. Uh, we're still pending response here for, our, for the uh, probation department's monitoring, just like we just did for the sheriff's department. Next slide, please. And so real quickly, I'd like for us, I'd like CLERB to, to continue. We don't have a vision statement, but our vision statement should be something along the lines of to assist the sheriff's department and probation department to provide fair, equitable, just, timely, informed, and compassionate service to the communities they serve and all the persons under their care. We are now proactive. We're not just reactive. Unfortunately, we're advisory only. As everyone knows, departments, none of, nobody has to listen to anything we say. And we've been told, oh, CLERB's not effective. CLERB's not effective. I contend over the last year and a half, we've been extremely proactive and, and as evidenced by what I just said to you folks. But we're only, we can only be as effective as the departments allow us to be with the way it's currently set up. So we'll continue to, uh, all of our activities to attain our vision. And I look forward to making this presentation again in six more months. Uh, more robust data moving forward, uh, considering that we now have an administrative analyst, thanks to this board. And with that, I will conclude my presentation uh, subject to your questions. Thank you, Paul. Uh, let's go to our public speakers, and we'll come back to board members for comments or questions. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have six total requests to speak on this item, two in person and four by phone. Also note for the record that we did not receive any e-comments on this item. Any members of the public that requested to speak by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers. We have one in favor and one in opposition. As your name is called, please come forward. I'd like to invite forward the speaker in favor of this item, Paul Hankin, followed by the speaker in opposition, Audra. You'll have two minutes to address the board. I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. Uh, Paul Hinken. Yeah. Um, this is apparently uh, the first time the Citizens Law Enforcement Review Board, or CLERB, has done a semi-annual report. This underscores the urgency of reforms in the county police department. Um, and I'm kind of shocked that so many recommendations were, um, were denied. I find it interesting that an independent review found almost the opposite of what I, many of us apparently believe, that residents of San Diego County are more, no more likely to die than residents of other Cali, Cali counties. Um, in, that in San Diego County, whites are more likely to die in jail, blacks are more likely to be in jail. 
uh, that there is a, the elevated risk of death appears to be isolated to the unsentenced population. And I wonder if um, some of that is actually political. Um, and uh, then public oversight of in-custody deaths lacks key information. It's shocking that the causes and manner of 13 out of 16 deaths in 2022 are still unknown. It's a huge concern that the CLRB cannot properly investigate non-sworn medical and other sheriff department personnel. And it's great that the state audit had the CLRB change its policy to finish casework on in-custody deaths within three months, but the case should not be rushed if the evidence is hidden or cannot be had in a timely manner. I believe that the report is a good one, not a sales pitch like COVID report and should be accepted. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thanks. Username Audra, thank you for that review. Um, you put a lot of work into it and I, I'm not against your doing that. But what I against is the fact that the sheriff's department isn't held accountable by anybody. Because even though you come in here and you make these recommendations, like you said, they don't have to do it, right? And it's like, these are important things. I mean, more people have died this year in custody than anybody with monkeypox. And yet we're in an emergency for monkeypox. Like that's, that's a real big problem. Who, how are they like, I mean, it makes your job almost obsolete if they don't do anything, which it shouldn't be. They should be taking your recommendations and implementing them. But like, who's to tell them that they have to do that? You know, it's like they can decide and dictate whether or not they want to share the information, if they want to put it under, um, like seal the deaths and stuff like that so nobody can find out about it. I mean, it's almost like, <laughs> how can you find anything out and how are these people gonna be held accountable for these deaths? I mean, the officers are bringing stuff into these jails. That's what happens. And if it's getting in in other ways, it's because they're not doing their job. So it's like, how does all that stuff get fixed? I mean, we just kind of go like, well, let them, you know, kill people when they're, it's fine, it's not a big deal, they don't really, I mean, and then, but then you arrest me for, for talking. I mean, were you hoping that I would die in there? I don't know. But it's like arresting people for things that are so minuscule, that's a huge problem too. Because the, the, the criminals are out on the streets, some of them are right here, and nothing's being done, so it's like, you know, but I, I appreciate you doing that and bringing information that nobody wants to hear. Because a lot of times we don't get that. And so I just appreciate you for doing that. And I hope that they, you know, listen. Thank you. We'll now hear from the individual that requested to speak by phone. Truth. The item says that, quote, San Diego County voters established the Citizens Law Enforcement Review Board, CLRB, in 1990 to provide independent investigation and oversight of the Sheriff and Probation Department. CLRB is composed of 11 volunteer board members nominated by the County of San Diego's Chief Administrative Officer and appointed by the Board of Supervisors. End quote. We can see where the problem is, although I still don't understand why these supervisors continue to twist what reported facts come out of CLRB when they're the ones who actually appoint the members. For example, these supervisors continually try to suggest that inmates are being systemically killed in the jails, when in reality, we have drug addicts overdosing or being poisoned with fentanyl, or even a larger number of natural deaths in the jails, eight of them. That's 45% of the deaths according to CLRB's 2021 annual report. And most deaths were of those classified as white at 50%. There are even a large number of inmates whose cause of death includes myocardial infarction, and most deaths are of people whose cause of death include several comorbidities. Of the closed death cases, there is a lot of cardiovascular disease, so it seems there needs to be changes in the meal plan and exercise regimes of the inmates. I do agree with CURB's recommendations about reducing traffic stops, 
such as expired registration, equipment violation, and no seatbelt in use, as well as no longer stopping people for jaywalking. But I disagree with CLRB about allowing loitering. So far this year alone, CLRB has cost over $1.5 million for only eight employees. And CLRB has more cases pending than closed. So anything these supervisors try to suggest will be based on missing information, also known as misinformation. And Chair Fletcher, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you. I'll go to Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Chair. And Paul, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate all your work and effort, and I can tell you're very passionate about it, and, and uh, you put a lot, of, a lot of time into it, and we really appreciate uh, all the work you do. Also, you know, you're, I know your CLRB uh, board, uh, the chairman of the board, or chair of the board, uh, Eileen Delaney, and, and uh, for her, all her contributions as well. I would have a question for you. Well, actually, I had to correct uh, my, my fellow colleague here after the last meeting. I was as an airline pilot for over 34 years with Delta, and, and um, all the airline the crew members, unfortunately, are not always checked. It's random. Uh, you, you go to a separate line, you show them your ID card, and you got a big, uh, they do an extensive background checks. And then maybe one out of 12, one out of 20, one out of six, it depends on whatever the day is, but they're randomly checked, so they're not uh, always checked. Um, and I, so I had a question about the fentanyl deaths. Um, are those mostly occurring, and what I'm trying to figure out if, if the fentanyl's coming into the jail or they're bringing it in when they get arrested. So are they, and they, uh, so I'm asking, it, it, do you know that? Like, are they dying within the first two or three days, or are they, or is it happening further on in, in the sentences? And and so it's coming in, or it's both. I, I'm just curious. Many of them are dying after that two or three days. That's our understanding. Okay. But to be clear, Can you say that again, many many of them are dying after two days or three days. Uh, however, they are bringing them in also. The body scanners are not infallible. Uh, when they're booked, and so that is a, a primary way. The body that they scanners are, are what? Not infallible. I mean, they okay. they can be. You know, you can you can smuggle it in, and not be caught on the body on the body scanner itself sometimes. So it does come in that way. But our evidence indicates that many of the many of the drug related deaths are happening over two days after being in custody, more than two or three days. Well, th th I was. It, what got explained to me uh, about the mail, uh, M-A-I-L, uh, right. is that, and you, you mentioned something about there's a lot non-legal mail versus right. legal, what's non-legal mail? So legal mail. mail, actually CLRB's mail is considered legal. Anything from a, from a legal entity, anything from, from their attorney is legal. That cannot be uh, looked at outside of their presence, is my understanding, outside of the incarcerated person's presence. However, non-legal mail, mail from family members, friends, or whatnot, is scanned all at Las Colinas. They have a mail processing unit at Las Colinas that scans that and finds substances that are attempted to be mailed in uh, to the incarcerated person. Okay, because one, one of the stories I, I heard was that, because I couldn't imagine somebody you know, smuggling in this stuff, but the fact that fentanyl, you know, three little like grains of salt, it, and I've heard it's been, like, been put underneath stamps or underneath the glue of the envelope. Or, or under a post-it note, or something like that. And, and for ten grains of, of fentanyl, or you know, grains of salt, you could think of that. It'd be very easy to smuggle. I would think. You know, it's that's so small. I mean, it's, can dogs actually sniff that quantity? Or uh, according to the out? sheriff's department, and I would refer, I would defer to Sheriff Ray. But my understanding from talking to the one dog handler that was in place at the time is yes, they can. Uh, they can do that. Now, also to your point, I, I want to point out that the sheriff's department has mentioned that since January of 2020, they've been, uh, till last month, they've administered Narcan on 400 different occasions. So it's getting in. It's getting but, in. So you said it was a recommendation to have all the mail, M-A-I-L, scanned. Yes. Uh, and, 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 but that's not being done right now. At, at this point, we're waiting for their response to that. Okay, because I, I guess I was going to say, you know, if there's some sort of a dog sniffing or some sort of uh, scanning of the mail and things like that, because um, you know, we want to keep our trust and faith with our officers as well. And if they sure. we're always there under scrutiny as well, all, sure. all the time, I think is, is kind of a push. And if there's other ideas, we, you know, especially for mail and things like that to get in, uh, to, I mean, three grains of salt is, is easy to probably get through. Uh, and, and if there's ways to cap to uh, go after that. So anyway, I, I appreciate the uh, input and, and uh, all the hard work and effort you put into it. Thanks. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Anderson. Uh, 
Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Uh, that was an outstanding report, and I really appreciate what the committee does, and uh, I think it's very important. I spent 12 years as the uh, Vice Chair of Public Safety, and I sat through many of these, but it was for correctional officers in our prison system. And uh, uh, can you tell us, and maybe you don't, you know, maybe this is a better question for the sheriffs, but uh, the scanning requires a lot of labor. The scanning requires somebody who actually understands. It's almost like a, uh, 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 a truth test where you need somebody manning it who's highly skilled, who understands the nuances. But I also understand that our dogs are, are really adept at catching drugs in that the drugs, I mean, the dogs are, are very, very effective. Wouldn't, couldn't we move to uh, lower technology and have drug, I mean, dog, dog sniffing, drug dogs? George you know what I mean. Dogs. I got you. <laughs> uh, wouldn't that be a faster process? And, you know, maybe we're not going to catch the three grains, but we're going to catch the 10 grains and above. And when you're thinking about uh, how, what a calamity it is with this stuff getting in, the other part is uh, what, we, what, what they found in the prison system is it wasn't so much correctional officers, it was other people working in the prisons. It was medical personnel, right. it was low right. level folks who came in who didn't want to risk their pension because perhaps they didn't have a pension. And uh, were more susceptible to those types of bribes. Supervisor Anderson, I, I agree with you in reference to the fentanyl dogs. Look, we strongly support uh, as many dogs as, as, as needed. Uh, we, we believe, I mean, look, they have three right now. It's nowhere near enough. Nowhere near enough. Uh, anything that we can recommend to reduce the likelihood of drugs getting to the incarcerated persons, we're going to support that. So the dogs would be great if they can have more than three. They have seven detention facilities, and what's their average daily population in addition to the staff uh, and folks coming in? And to the point about staff, I'm not just talking about deputies. I'm, I'm, I'm saying deputies too. Let's be honest. Yes, I am. But I'm also talking about contractors, civilian personnel, county employee, anybody that comes in somehow should, you know, it'd be great if you could have a dog sn uh, sniff them at minimum. It'd be wonderful. Um, but again, it's all about the resources that they have. Do they have enough? I don't think so. And do you believe that through some of this is simply a, a labor issue? I mean, I know that we recently had uh, made some recommendations to, to shore up the labor and to get more deputies online. It, it, how much of a role does that play in your opinion? Clearly three dogs is, you know, a, a big issue, but what about additional labor? Uh, look, you're asking my personal opinion. Yeah. My personal opinion is uh, obviously, look, look at the mandatory overtime that's having to happen. Look at the, the, the hours that these folks are working. Uh, it's ridiculous. The morale is not very high, is my understanding, because of the number of hours they're having to work and the staffing that they don't have. So we would agree that they need something. They need more staffing. They need some help. So anything that this board can do, uh, I would continue to support that as well. Because ultimately, who's at risk? Yes, the incarcerated persons are at risk. But so too are the people that are working inside those facilities, especially when they're tired, especially when they're not staffed enough, and especially when drugs are getting into the facilities and that ultimately then are placing the incarcerated persons at risk or leading to behaviors that could jeopardize the folks working in the jails, not just the deputies, but the counselors, medical, you name it. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Watson Reamer. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I first just really want to thank uh, you for the tremendous work and for uh, really the entire group. Um, I, I guess I just want to zoom out big picture. I mean, I think this was just a very, very helpful and thorough report, but I wanted to go back uh, to the slides where you were looking at the recommendations that had not been implemented. Um, and just kind of get a better sense of your analysis as to sort of why. A lot of the reasons, uh, many of the reasons that were cited were operational delays. And I, I for, for, for many of them. Can we, we go back to the slide? Sure. Uh, let's go to page, um, 
Let's do, let's start with 2021. So pay, uh, slide number 14. Well, actually, let's not do that one, only because these, these are reasonable. Let's, let's, let's talk about um, slide number 28. Let's start with 28, please. Okay, now, now 28, while it's coming up, 28 deals completely with racial disparity. So those recommendations were not accepted because the Sheriff's Department, number one, at its core, doesn't believe that there are racially disparate practices, number one. Number two, the reason that many of these were not accepted was because the department believes that, how are you supposed to look the other way if there's an offense? How are you supposed to do that? How are you supposed to look at whether or not there'll be racially disparate outcome because then technically are you not discriminating in the process? Uh, so that would, those were the general reasons that the racially disparate recommendations to address that issue were not accepted. And, in, and But the last one about the body-worn camera, looking at it for the purpose of analyzing um, interactions between white folks and persons of color, uh, they said that they're already doing that. Now, I don't, the, the, the supervisor is doing it. They are, they are looking randomly at body-worn camera. Do I think it's for that purpose? Is it specifically for that purpose? I don't think so. I don't think so. But they are, they are randomly reviewing body-worn camera footage. So that's, that, that's why those recommendations were not accepted. Supervisor, would maybe move to the next page? Mm -hmm. next, next slide, please. So the ones that also were not accepted dealt with that death, the vehicle pursuit. And again, I contend, just like we made the recommendations for lower level offenses, I'm saying the same thing here. Why create a public safety risk to chase folks for a property crime? At least what you know at the time. Now, I'm not saying that if something comes in, it's an armed robbery that just occurred, or it's a homicide suspect, or it's a carjacking, and that's the vehicle, look. And the, the deputies weigh all factors when initiating and participating in these vehicle pursuits. But if all you know at the time is that, but they said that because for that one, in addition to the, the public safety factors, um, that they already are, are, are looking at the public safety factors and that the outcome of many of these pursuits, it's a lot more than just what's on the surface. There are guns, there are drugs, there are felons. Those are true statements. That's true. But that's why they said no to those. And, I be, and then as far as the body scanning of incarcerated persons upon the transfer between facilities, the, they did not accept that because it would cause operational delays. It would be huge backlogs with people coming into facilities after being transferred. And so the operational delays. And I don't believe uh, to this board, I mean, this board just recommended uh, additional funding for the body scanners. They don't have enough of them. That's the other issue. Mm, that's very, very helpful. Um, I, I think what I find interesting is, correct me if I'm wrong, only one of these, um, of the recommendations not accepted, uh, addresses the jails. Is there any, everything else that was the, recommended regarding the jails was accepted? Either they're accepted or they're pending. Uh, response. Pending their response. The Pending their, re we've made the recommendation to them. They're analyzing it and going to respond to us officially. However, to the point of scanning all persons, scanning, searching something, all persons entering to include staff, contractors, or county employees, or all persons in, including those people, the department, their, PI, their public information officer was already quoted in the Union Tribune last week saying, I'm not going to do it. But that's not. That's under pending. It's under pending. Under, it's still okay. pending. Okay. We anticipate that's going to be a not accepted, because they they've already said it. Do you do you think you can walk through where you anticipate these falling, kind of one by one? Sure. Do I whether I think that they're going to be? Mm -hmm. uh, so the arresting officer questions. There was a concern. This this came from a death uh, investigation we did. There were concerns about there's when you get booked into jail. There's this questionnaire that's filled out. And there's a section that says arresting officer questions. And it talks about the incarcerated person and their, their drugs and, and, and medical uh, issues. 
During the course of our investigation, it was revealed that sometimes the arresting officer isn't the one providing the answers to that. Other, we didn't know who was giving those answers, so the department is looking at those. The digitally scanned and disseminate that non-legal mail, as Supervisor Desmond brought up, uh, that's the one where we're saying, do we think they're gonna do that? My gut? No. I don't think so, because it would, it's gonna cost a lot of money if they wanna implement any kind of kiosk to do that, to have the incarcerated persons look at the mail electronically. Uh, we have to remember, the incarcerated persons right now, they can get email. They can get email. So we can tend maybe just scan it in a PDF, and, but again, having incarcerated persons stand at a computer terminal to look at it would lead to some delays, which is why we're thinking, well, maybe you can just print it out and give it to them that way. But I don't know. I don't think so. Physically search and scan all persons entering? No. It's not going to happen. I would think not. Um, transgender. There were some concerns. We identified some issues, some perhaps some systemic issues. Uh, and the department has gone a long way already to try to address those issues. But we recommended that incarcerated persons shall be taken to the facility coinciding with their gender identity. We don't, we don't really know how that's going to go. Uh, in Imperial Beach, there were some concerns with the public filming deputies and deputies not responding uh, appropriately or at all. Uh, so, and that's only happened to us, been reported to us via the, uh, at the Imperial Beach substation, but we recommended that they update and disseminate. The public can record the police document. We think that'll happen. We think they'll do that. Uh, create a training bulletin about handicapped parking. There may have been some confusion. We think they'll do that. And to expand the body-worn camera protocol to mandate usage on all law enforcement-related contacts, not just in-person ones, what we mean is if someone's making a report on the phone only, to turn your BWC, you know, to record that, we think that they'll do that. So that's where we stand, <coughs> Supervisor. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, that's really, really helpful. Um, and then on the, yeah, I, sorry, I'll just, I'll just stop there. I think, um, I think this is just, very method methodical and really rigorous and kind of helps uh, us think about in a much more grounded way, you know, what, what we need to be doing. And I, I think it's really helpful and really, really important work. So, so I thank you for that. I, we all know that we have <clears throat> a crisis in our jails with uh, the jail deaths. And I think we're all committed across the board to doing something about that. I know the sheriff wants to do something about that as well. And so, um, to the extent that we are looking at uh, reports that CLIRB is bringing that could have helped us tackle our jail death problem, I think it's just really tremendously helpful. So thank you again. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you. Supervisor Desmond. I just, I'd like to make a motion to uh, accept the uh, report, uh, accept the uh, Chief Administrative Officer recommendation to receive both of these reports. Yeah, I think <laughs> uh, happy to second that, uh, accepting the 2021 annual and 2022 semi-annual report. Um, you know, as a county, we're, we are, really trying to move aggressively to make sure we keep our community safe and make sure we keep those who come into our custody safe as well. Um, and I think it's important that, that we do both. Our board has taken a series of actions, significant funding for mental health clinicians, significant funding for infrastructure to build the physical space that is needed to be able to deliver those, uh, a different approach to medical care um, and a greater investment in that. And I think that there's a lot more on the horizon along with the things that we're trying to do to deal with the immediacy of it, both the staffing, uh, mandatory overtime, as you alluded to, is not a good situation. Uh, it's not where you want to have folks in. Uh, the night premium differentials, the lateral bonuses, I mean, all of those things, plus the, the physical efforts we're taking uh, around scanners and perhaps we need greater canine resources and others. Um, and we're going to continue to work. But, you know, Paul, I think when you came in, we had a, a Citizens Law Enforcement Review Board that was significantly behind, in many cases not being investigated, not happening. And even with the increase, I appreciate to see that all of your cases are being completed uh, within the statutory timeline. Uh, I look forward to the issues around medical coming back. I've long said I understand that. I agree with that. Uh, and we're committed to making sure that you have the ability to talk to medical personnel uh, along with sworn personnel. And then we'll continue to make sure you have the funding and staffing you need. Um, outside of the things that you've outlined around medical personnel and some of the other things, do you have the, the funding and staffing that you need to pursue uh, what is coming into you? Are you set up right now to be able to uh, um, appropriately investigate the cases that come before you? 
I believe right at this moment we, we have a, an investigator in training. I'll be better able to say once he is fully trained. I do think that uh, I'll, I'll be discussing with Ebony for, for uh, maybe next fiscal year cycle. We're going to need some, something about detention facility inspections. That's something that we can do. We need an expert to be able to do that. And uh, if the jurisdiction changes for medical and mental health care, we're going to need some additional assistance with that. Okay. Keep us posted and let us know um, on that. We want to make sure you're equipped. And then do you have the freedom to go out and, and speak freely, uh, your own independent voice uh, around what you find and what you see? Absolutely. No one in this county is, has shut me up. Good. Uh, well, that's important. I mean, that's that's why it is an independent entity that is, is designed to, to go where you need to go and be able to seek the facts you need to seek. So um, if any of those ever change, you let us know. Um, thank you for all of the hard work, and, and we look forward to monitoring in the future. Uh, we have a motion by Supervisor Desmond, seconded by myself. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. We'll now go to uh, our final agenda item today, uh, agenda item 22, approved amendments to board policy G16, capital facilities planning. I'll turn it over to uh, team for presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ch Chair Fletcher and members of the board. Modern in well-maintained infrastructure is key to our ability to provide exceptional services to the public and provide high-quality workplaces for our county employees. Uh, every March, we come to your board with approval for the Capital Improvement Needs Assessment, or the CENA, and today we're coming to your board to present proposed amendments to the policy that guides the development of the CENA. Um, the proposed amendments are designed to advance equity, increase transparency into the capital project planning process, and here to discuss the amendments is Marco Medved, our Director of General Services. Thank you, Ebony. Uh, CENA is a planning document that forecasts all planned and potential capital projects over a five-year period. Preparation of this CENA is guided by Board Policy G16, Capital Facilities Planning. The policy provides a framework for the facility planning process and identifies the evaluation criteria. Recent efforts by your board have established the county's commitment to advance equity and sustainability and increase transparency into this process. Our proposed amendments were developed through a series of working group meetings with subject matter experts, consultations with community ad advocacy groups, and thorough research, research into best practices established by other municipalities. The amendments were also presented to a community stakeholders group for review and feedback at a virtual workshop in late July. The CNET focuses ex exclusively on capital projects, so I think it's important to clearly define what qualifies as a capital project for the county. The capital project includes new county buildings, recreational facilities, or land acquisition that supports an existing county program run by one of our departments and requires capitalization for financial reporting purposes. Examples of capital projects include improvements to existing county parks, new county libraries or fire stations, and sheriff stations within the county service area. There are a number of critical, important, uh, critically important topics to our county that require action but are separate from capital facilities planning process and policy that, are that we're discussing today. For example, we're often asked about affordable housing, county roadway repairs, fire stations or libraries not within the existing county service area, public transit, and county programs located in leased buildings. Although these projects are not part of the capital facilities planning uh, policy, there are other avenues for moving these projects forward outside of SENA. So how does a capital project get added to SENA? Uh, when you roll it down, there are three main paths. Uh, the first path is through st strategic facilities plans, which are professionally prepared reports analyzing portfolios of our current facilities, their condition, location, and any gaps in service. The resulting uh, uh, data drives uh, recommendations for new facilities, replacement of existing facilities, as well as consolidations, and my favorite, demolition. We're uh, just finishing up our first round of strategic facility plans for county fire, libraries, and sheriff stations. We also have them underway for regional centers and detention facilities. And uh, we're gearing up to start work on uh, behavioral health strategic facility plan. Uh, community input and board input are also very important to the, to the puzzle in identifying projects. Uh, community and board input is incorporated into the sponsoring department's project plans. This means if a stakeholder wants to get a project added to the CENA, they'd work directly with the department responsible for that requirement to help develop it. 
Finally, operational need plays a big role in project identification. For instance, a new fire district could come on, on board um, and be absorbed into the county service area, as we recently saw in Ramona, and this might prompt new construction or major systems renewal. So we're proposing four main enhancements to our five-year planning process. Uh, the first being to create a central place on a county website, which is already up, where, we can, where everyone can interact and learn about projects being proposed. Uh, second would be to apply best practices uh, for community engagement. This includes our departments working together to help each other grow and share ways um, to, for re robust community interaction and how it can be achieved in order to assist with transparency and to ensure uh, the community has voice. Uh, third would be the annual community engagement workshop to review the draft SENA at an enterprise level and to allow community stakeholders to provide feedback directly to the program departments. And lastly, we're proposing projects to be assessed for alignment with uh, our county planning principles. And here you see the principles which are um, part of your strategic plan. So the capital planning principles are designed to gauge the degree to which the project advances the county's five strategic, ini strategic initiatives. Uh, we've added a sixth principle, project readiness, to assess whether a project's ready for implementation. Uh, maturing projects through the five-year plan, including pre-construction, ensures that these projects are ready for construction funding. Uh, we cannot implement a project that does not have fully vetted scope, uh, hasn't gone through environmental due diligence, or uh, has a rigorous construction estimate. Uh, the proposed amendment will allow for more transparency in the SENA process now as departments will be required to complete an alignment assessment form for every project recommended for funding on year one of the SENA. The qualitative da data collected on the alignment assessment forms will be available as a narrative for review on our website. And the assessment is uh, designed to provide more transparency and understanding as to the why the projects have been selected for inclusion on the SENA. So the SENA, this is the SENA development timeline. Um, the timeline never stops. It's an annual cycle, um, but it's five years long. And this year we'll add uh, three new touch points uh, with the community and board offices as shown here in light, light blue at uh, three o'clock, four o'clock, and seven o'clock. So here's the annual drumbeat of our five-year planning process. Uh, in the middle of the cycle, or the circle, you'll see a green circle. Uh, this represents the ongoing engagement from departments all, all year long. So stakeholders can engage the departmental program people anytime during the year, uh, and then their feedback will flow into the SENA cycle, which has just kicked off this year in August. And right after our groups approve departmental projects in September, we'll integrate the projects into the first uh, draft five-year plan, and uh, it'll provide your board with a preview um, before holding an enterprise uh, community engagement. So those are both new things this year. Then we'll provide, um, then we'll post the plan and the supporting project narratives on our website approximately two weeks prior to holding that community session. In October, uh, the county will host a community forum where we'll share the five-year uh, forecast and gather um, direct feedback and online feedback. Uh, the community input, the departmental assessments, and the proposed uh, five-year forecast are then reviewed by the Facility Planning Board, our Office of Equity and Racial Justice in November, followed by the general managers in December and the CAO in, de in January. A recalibration of the enterprise plan will occur at each of these levels based on county needs and balancing against uh, resources that are available. And then also in January, we'll update your offices with the proposed five-year forecast of projects and then do a final recalibration based on your feedback. And this will generate a board letter in February uh, that will go before your board in March. So in closing, uh, we recommend you approve these amendments to policy G16. And that concludes our presentation subject to your questions. Thank you, Marco. Uh, let's hear from any public speakers we have on this item. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have seven total requests to speak on item 22, two in person and five by phone. Also note for the record that we did not receive any e-comments. For any members of the public that requested to speak on item 22 by phone, please dial under the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers. Both speakers are in opposition of this item. I'd like to invite forward Audra and Paul Hankin. We'll have two minutes to address the board. I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. Um, 
Paul Hinken. Um, this, the capital improvements policy has a few good ideas, but it needs to be redone. In the new policy, you struck prioritize from the uh, strategy to manage and plan. Prioritizing is integral, integral to planning, if not thinking. The director, it says, the director of general services is authorized to make minor adjustments, 10% or less, to the approved requirements if necessitated. That is quite a lot, like, like a new bedroom in each apartment. He's a, he can do that without public input or possibly knowledge. Group, again, possibly without public knowledge. Um, a lot of secrecy there. It, uh, it says, quote, asset owners will identify a need to repair, replace, improve, or construct a new facility based on failing condition, a lack of facility lack of facility, inadequate facility, or health and safety. Uh, this means a lot of proposals based on the owner's own subjective ideas. Do I hear a draft or is it graft? Um, you can write all the descriptive stuff you want in the thing, but it's like a sales job and um, anyway, it's not a Great thing. Thank you for your attention. Next speaker, please. Use the name Audra. So community engagement, you asked 70 people about this. Do you guys feel like that's a good number to determine if it's right? Because 70 people will come in here and tell you they don't want you to do something and you'll still do it. So. I don't know why you guys even ask for community engagement because you don't even care about it. Um, but your whole zero net energy and uh, making these buildings be part of your whole climate crap fiasco um, because you want to promote sustainability and environmental justice, yet like lithium batteries and these things that you want to use are totally toxic to the environment. So it's like, in the process of claiming that you're saving it, you're also destroying it. You want to have drought resistant landscape. I mean, if you planted trees, um, that would actually help, but you're claiming there's a drought, but Nathan, didn't you just say there was water coming up from the ground? <gasps> Weird, thought that didn't happen. Or is there enough water in the earth? We're not actually in a drought. You saw it come up from the ground, Nathan, you're not listening. Because you don't care. Because you don't care about community engagement, right? It's good to know. It's only if the people agree with you that you want to listen to it. Good to know. Good to know. It's a joke, right? I mean, the fact that you claim that you're like doing all these good things and you're like causing people to spend more money to put in all this bullshit like electric charging stations that, I mean, Helen, weren't you saying that there's, a, how are we gonna charge all that stuff? Is the power grid gonna be able to handle that? But let's force everybody into that. It, we'll come to that problem and offer a solution later on. Thank you. We'll now hear from the individuals that requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd remind the callers that they should meet their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We'll begin with our first caller. Uh, three new touch points uh, with the community and board offices as shown here in light, light blue at uh, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 7 o'clock. So here's the annual drumbeat of our five-year planning process. Uh, in the middle of the cycle, or the circle, you'll see a green circle. Uh, this represents the ongoing engagement from the department all, all year long. So stakeholders can engage the Department of Program people anytime during the year, uh, and then their feedback will flow into the SENA cycle, which is just kicked off this year in August. And right after our groups, we've developed projects 
September, we'll integrate the project with the first uh, draft project plan and uh, we'll provide you with a preview um, before holding an enterprise uh, community engagement. So those are both new things this year. And we'll provide, um, and we'll post the plan and the supporting project narratives on our website approximately two weeks prior to holding that community session. In October, uh, the county will host a community forum where we'll share the project uh, forecast and gather um, direct feedback and online feedback. Uh, the community input, the departmental assessments, and the proposed uh, five-year forecast are then reviewed by the Facility Planning Board, our Office of Equity and Racial Justice in November, followed by the General Managers in December and CAO in, in January. A uh, recalibration of the enterprise plan will occur at each of these levels based on county needs, balancing against uh, resources that are available. And then also in January, we'll update your offices with the proposed five-year forecast projects and then do a final recalibration based on feedback. And this will generate a board letter in February uh, that will go before your board. Uh, so in closing, uh, we recommend to approve this amendment to the policy G16. That concludes our presentation. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have seven total requests to speak, and I'd like to do in person. Thank you. For the record, that speaker was Consuelo. We'll now hear from the next caller. Hi. My name is Blair Overstreet from the Center on Policy Initiatives and the Invest in San Diego Families Coalition. I'm calling today in support of item number 22, which recommends revisions to county policy G16 in order to create a more transparent and equitable SENA process. We'd like to thank the CAO and Board of Supervisors for being responsive to ISCF's call to revise the Capital Improvement Needs Assessment process in March of this year, as well as the many county staff for collaborating with our organization and coalition partners to develop the proposed policy recommendations presented to the board today. The SENA is an important planning document that represents funding priorities for over one billion public dollars. The revisions presented today have the potential to improve this critical decision-making process to make it more clearly defined, transparent, and equity-focused. There should be clear criteria uplifting values such as equity and sustainability as outlined here. And it's important to continue to evaluate the process to make sure that use of these criteria deliver outcomes that support the health and safety of San Diegans. For example, this year's plan includes almost a quarter billion dollars of investments in the carceral system, including the construction of three new sheriff stations. San Diegans need more of our public dollars spent on the health and safety of our communities by building more affordable housing, green space, public bathrooms, and other projects that uplift the needs of low-income families and BIPOC communities. The updated timeline is a great step in the right direction by creating more transparency and for the first time creates a window of opportunity for the public to review a draft list and share input. More transparency and accountability in this process overall is the first step toward the county moving to becoming more equitable and responsive when it comes to building large infrastructure projects. Please vote in support of these items which represent a positive step by the, county, by the county to create a more transparent and equitable capital improvement needs assessment process. Thank you so much for your time and your attention today. Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. It's true. Well, this whole item seems to be yet another dedication to the cult of sustainability. It's just in a capital facilities planning version this time. Will the World Economic Forum inspired reimagined general management system and strategic plan? Praise be to the Rockefeller inspired just sustainable and resilient future for all. May all bow in reverence to the racist equity lens that blinds our views in the worst way. Where normal hardworking people become stigmatized and victimized when they're called names like marginalized and underserved. And you know what's funny? The former Capital Improvement Needs Assessment Plan included, quote, quantifiable reduced operating costs, customer service benefits, and a positive impact on the quality of life in the county, end quote. But guess what? That's all been cut in this new sustainability cult version of the plan. But they did make sure to add, quote, capital improvement projects include land acquisition, end quote. Isn't that nice? 
taking the land from the people. Never forget, green is the new red, but you have a choice. Instead of like in the Soviet Union where they only had Soviet seafoam green, here in America with a K, you can have both sustainable slime green bike lanes as well as 100 plus unit sustainable slate gray stack it packed prison block projects everywhere. This is the resilient and reimagined future in this plan, along with even worse things, if all of you listening don't speak out against the decarbonization framework that will be approved at tomorrow's meeting. I've got one that can see. And Chair Fletcher, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, you know, thank you very much, uh, Marco, and, and to the whole staff uh, for bringing this updated uh, CNA process. Appreciate all the hard work that's gone into this policy, and I know that I like there's a lot more opportunity for community engagement. I like it when the community sets the priorities, and then we go find the money for it. So, uh, the new process is beneficial. I hope there's going to be some flexibility in placing and ranking the projects. I think for the county to be successful in the long term, we're going to need some flexibility as the needs of our district changes and our communities change as well. So I'd like to say thank you very much for all you've done on this, and I'd like to move to approve uh, the item. All right, we have a motion by Supervisor Desmond, second by Vice Chair Vargas. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. Each meeting, I ask if any of my colleagues want to provide a brief update, reports on progress, or pertinent information around boards and commissions that they serve on. We'll go to Vice Chair Vargas first. I'll be quick. Um, so just wanted to share a couple of things. Uh, August 18, I attended the, uh, the signing ceremony that I announced the new Minute 238, which is the binational treaty, which is a framework with projects and funding to address the public health care crisis of the transboundary uh, wastewater pollution in the Tijuana River Valley. Um, and so I will be representing uh, our communities there. And then on August 22nd, I attended the groundbreaking ceremony for the new East Otami Support of Entry, which is a project of more than two decades uh, and work that we're doing through as um, Chair of Transportation for Sandag. Target comp completion is 2024. And then last but not least, uh, last week on Thursday, August 25th at CARB, we voted to support the Advanced Clean Cars to regulation that presents the plan for zero emission vehicle transitions, which is a historical vote. Um, and the regulation is for cars and light trucks. Sets car sale goals in California starting in 2026 and matches the governor's goal of 100% sales to be only zero emission by 2035. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I shared some of that because I think it's uh, work for the county. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Vice Chair. Not seeing anyone else, we'll go to our adjournments in memory today. Vice Chair Vargas will be first honoring Eric Adams. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> today I would like to adjourn this meeting in honor of Mr. Eric Adams, one of San Diego's and the transportation industry's finest project managers and engineers. Eric grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and graduated from Temple, Temple University. He led numerous planning, uh, transit rail, and highway projects over the course of his career in transportation, including MTS and Sandag. Eric was raised in, north, in the North by a strong and resilient woman, and he was an exemplary professional family man and friend. Together with Rhonda, the love of his life, they raised Raven and Eric Jr., their children, and Rancho Bernardo. They were huge supporters of this community and were faithful members of the African Methodist Episcopalian Church. Eric, the son from the city of Brotherly Love Philly, is now in transit on another journey, but only after using all of his talent to improve our community. Beside him are his wife, Rhonda, and their two children, Dr. Raven Adams, a pediatrician, and Eric Jr., a Navy professional. Eric, San Diego County is a much better place because of you, and today we adjourn this meeting in his honor. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, I'd like to adjourn today's Board of Supervisors meeting uh, in remembrance and honor of Dr. Willie Morrow. Dr. Morrow passed away this year, uh, and it is, I think, important that we take a moment to share the impact that he had on our community and the broader world. Uh, Dr. Willie Morrow wore many hats, a hairstylist, an author, researcher, teacher, historian, product formulator, inventor. Uh, he was a man of minty talents. Uh, most of all, he had a tremendous will and determination uh, to beat any odds in any deck that was stacked against him. Dr. Willie Morrow was born in Alabama in 1939 and from an early age taught himself basic barbering uh, and the skills that would go on to serve him and his community well. He attended the Barber College right here in San Diego. He lived with his uncle near 30th Street and Logan Avenue while he attended classes at the Independent Barber College on Fifth Avenue, where he graduated in 1959. 
In the 1960s, he crafted what was said to become the nation's first commercially produced Afro pick, modeling it after a handmade comb from Africa. Dr. Morrow authored the first black barber and beauty history book entitled 400 Years Without a Comb, written in 1971, and which is still the preeminent source of black American beauty information to this day. The United States Department of Defense contracted Dr. Morrow uh, as a civilian to teach military barbers how to treat and cut black hair. This was done on military bases around the world. He established the first live black radio station, 92.5, which fueled the success of many San Diego businesses throughout San Diego County for more than a decade. And in 1977, he started the company California Curl after creating a product that relaxed the hair and gentle curls, a style he says inspired the popular 1980s jerry curl to the civilian beauty industry. His family summed up his life in an incredible way. It, it, it is not possible to summarize his contribution and achievements without talking all day. Suffice it to say the world is a better place because of him. He will be remembered as always working to lift up the black community in San Diego and beyond. We send our deepest condolences to his wife, Gloria Morrow, his two daughters, Cheryl and Angela, and the entire Morrow family. We will forever remember Dr. Willie Morrow and his remarkable contribution to San Diego County. At this point, we will return to closed session public speakers and then non-agenda public speakers. I'll ask the clerk to call forward the remaining speakers. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have three requests to speak on matters listed on closed session, one in person and two by phone. For the individuals that requested to speak by phone on closed session matters, please dial in at the conference line now. I'd like to invite forward our in-person speaker in opposition to the in-home supportive services public authority closed session item, Audra. Please come forward. You'll have two minutes to address the board. Use the name Audra. I love how you have to point out if people are in favor or in opposition. It's great. Um, but you do post people's slips anyway online, which is totally weird. Um, anyway, so review boards. And here we are again talking about the people reviewing people that actually should be reviewed themselves. Um, I mean, because it's kind of weird, Nora, that you guys are worried about the TJ wastewater but we're giving people wastewater to drink. Is that, that sounds like that should be reviewed. But like I said, it's like nobody's holding the sheriffs accountable. Nobody's holding you guys accountable, but you guys can hold everybody else accountable. It's very weird that that seems okay. Yeah, but I guess like, you, you know, you review yourselves and you think you're doing well. I mean, you don't even want community input because you come and get, people come here and fill the room, tell you shit and you don't give a shit because you're just gonna do what you want, right, Nathan? That's what you say. I'm gonna, you guys can come in here and say what you want, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna do what I want. Is that your job? Hmm? for you guys to just do whatever you want, like a tyrant? Are you a king? Do you have royal blood? It's crazy, I don't know. I'm just like, what makes you guys untouchable? Hmm? Hmm? Is it the marble right here? that makes you guys think that you're like super special? Chair Fletcher, I'm not seeing any of the callers that requested to speak on closed session matters. So with that, we'll move on to the final non-agenda public uh, comment. We have 11 requests to speak on matters not listed on the agenda, one in person and 10 by phone. For those that requested to speak by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the, the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the remaining in-person speaker. I'd like to invite forward Paul Hankin. You'll have two minutes to address the board. Okay, I'm Paul Hankin. Uh, too often, the uh, the description, the discussion, and the agenda item begins with the history of an item 
for a lengthy narrative of all the good things the proposal would do. A panegyric, if you will. I distrust these just by seeing how long it takes to justify the item, like a sales pitch. Uh, a few of them, mostly from Jim, I believe, are a short narrative. Um, but putting a one or two sentence statement of the actual need for a proposal might focus your thinking, focus our criticism on what really matters, and help you realize when the proposal is wrong or affecting people it shouldn't and also shorten the meetings. Um, I have noticed also that some people are treated differently if they are in favor of an agenda item. For instance, they seem to be allowed to finish their last sentence more often. This is a courtesy which should be extended to everyone. If they are speaking, do not cut them off in mid-sentence. I want to hear the whole punchline, if there is one. I would also like to say thank you when done. You guys should go back to the old world of procedure instead of the new knee-jerk reaction to a few baddies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We'll now hear from those that requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted and you'll hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'll remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. Begin with our first caller. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Terry Ann Skelly. I've been following the supervisor's consideration of marijuana businesses where I live. As a mother of three adult sons, I've worked on behalf of young adults to safeguard their passage to productive adulthood. I called in today to express my concern that marijuana businesses in our rural neighborhoods are a very unfortunate and unwise move. Major media, out, media outlets reported significant news last week that marijuana and hallucinogens Used in the past year by young adults, 19 to 30 years old, increased meaningfully in 2021 compared to five and 10 years ago. Monitoring the future, MTS, um, MTS, F, sorry, researchers, in accordance with the National Institute of Health and their press releases, announced that these rates were historic, highest rates in this age group since 1998. As the National Institute of Drug Abuse, NIDA Director, Dr. Nora Volko, MD, commented last week, and I quote, young adults are in, in a critical life stage. She also quoted, it is critical to help position these new generation for success. Now is not a good time for our young adults to experience the enticing advertising and predatory marketing and promotion that will come from how having marijuana businesses in our community. Thank you for listening. My concerns. Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. Good afternoon, Chair Fletcher and County Supervisors. My name is Becky Rapp. I'm a parent and planning group attendee. While attending a planning group last week, I was pleased to see they had agendized Supervisor Anderson's recommendation to enhance cannabis control and safety measures. Although no planning groups have asked for marijuana cultivation and sales in their communities, they appreciate the suggestions for enhancement measures, primarily for the health, safety, and welfare of residents. This planning group voted to write a letter to the supervisors to not only recommend the support of the safety measures, but also to encourage the supervisors to strengthen those measures. One suggestion in regards to enhancement measure recommendation number two was discussed and adopted to include in a letter suggesting to the supervisors to not only increase the distance from 600 to 1,000 feet around sensitive uses, but also to specify how the distance is measured, suggesting the measurement be taken from property line to property line or as a crow flies. 
this would be the only fair and equitable way to measure. Planning groups would also like to see enhancement measure recommendation number three strengthened. They feel billboards should not be permitted in and around any community. The state of California has banned all marijuana billboards on interstate freeways for the sole purpose of the negative impact marijuana messaging has on children and youth. It would be wise to follow their lead and ban all marijuana billboards. If billboards on freeways are impressionable on our children and youth to the point of banning them, then I would think billboards in our communities and neighborhoods have an even more significant effect and should in no way be permitted. Please consider these suggestions as well as strengthening other enhancement control and safety measures. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll hear from the next caller. Anne Riddle, good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. I wanted to share with you some quotes from Dr. Crota Alexander, a medical doctor and associate professor of medicine at UC San Diego. It was in the UT over the weekend that it was in support of Proposition 31, and it was entitled, Yes, Flavored Tobacco Ban Protects Kids and Saves Lives. As you know, Proposition 31 is going to be on the November ballot and parents are very supportive of the proposition to ban these products. As she mentions in her opinion piece, Big Tobacco is a billion dollar marketing scheme to get California kids hooked on nicotine for life. She also mentions that it's no surprise that 96% of high school e-cigarette users, sometimes called vapors, in California use flavored e-cigarettes. She also says, and reminds us that tobacco-related diseases are the leading cause of preventable death in California, in fact, the United States, and in the world, and that one of the goals, the business plan of Big Tobacco, is to hook a new generation of loyal customers to their deadly products, calling them replacement smokers. As I read this and her other thoughtful comments, as a person who's worked in tobacco prevention for a couple of decades, I couldn't help but think this sounds just like the types of things that we hear about marijuana. It is definitely a big marijuana world, and it is definitely a million-dollar scheme to use flavored high-THC products to hook our young people, and it's certainly part of their business plan. The parent community supports Prop 31, and we hope that our Board of Supervisors will support us and perhaps add flavored marijuana products to your flavored tobacco products ban. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. Consuelo, I wanted to end the meeting today with a jazz song. Tara, it totally reminded me of you, not for nothing. And I know that, Nathan, sometimes you probably want to play this song, too. Come on. Shut up. Shut your big mouth, girl. Your lips are flapping like two blankets on a stiff breeze. You're talking me tired. I'm exhausted from listening to you. Your mom runs just like a... Just shut up. Shut your big mouth, girl. I sure do wish you'd shut your mouth. Shut your big mouth, girl. Shut your wish you'd shut your mouth. When you just keep on talking and talking, and you don't know what you're talking about. Well, I've never seen nobody that could talk as much as you when you must be drinking bourbon. I'm smoking reefers too. Shut your big mouth, girl. Shut the wish you shut your mouth. Well, you just keep on talking and talking, and you don't know what you're talking about. Well, you stand around here bragging about things that you can have. You should get right out of here and gather all that you can grab. Shut your big mouth, baby. 
God, I'm sure I wish you'd shut your mouth. Well, you just keep on talking and talking, and you don't know what you're talking about. you don't know what you're talking about. Thank you. Now hear from the final caller. Good evening, Board of Supervisors. My name is Diane Grace. As a grandmother, I feel defenseless against the marijuana advertising and promotions that are part of having marijuana businesses in our county. For those parents and grandparents grappling with their children's marijuana use, I highly recommend the speaker series provided by the International Academy on the Science and Impact of Cannabis, also known as ISAAC. Speakers can assist parents and grandparents with reliable information on marijuana that can be shared with their young adults. Our youth are going to need this information to counter the big tobacco, the big marijuana storyline just meant to encourage marijuana use and sales. I listened to the presentation from Bertha Madras, professor of psychobiology, Harvard Medical School, who also directs the Laboratory of Addiction Neurobiology at McLean Hospital, a Harvard Medical School hospital affiliate. The author of Opioids and Overdose Doses, she is expert witness in federal marijuana cases. She deplores the slowness of politicians who waited too long to act and ignored the authentic voice of parents and youth workers who saw the opioid epidemic unfolding. She feels that scenario is happening again with marijuana, with high concentrates of marijuana leading the way. As a parent and grandparent, I ask if this Board of Supervisors really feels that enough protections for youth are in place. Thank you for considering my concerns. Thank you, and Chair Fletcher, that concludes the request for non-agenda public communication this afternoon. All right, that concludes our uh, open session agenda. We will uh, recess into closed session. Uh, we will start in 10 minutes, closed session at 5 p.m. Thanks, everyone. The board will now recess into closed session to consider those matters listed under item 23 on today's regular agenda and item one on the in-home supportive services public authority agenda. If there are any reportable actions, they will be reported out during the planning and land use session of this meeting tomorrow, Wednesday, August 31st, 2022. I bet you were a wonderful child.